The observer would like to advise that the following video comes with a trigger warning. The content in this video is of a sensitive nature, so please beware that the topic of this video may trigger you. The observer recommends that you consider your own mental health before you watch this video. I on my normal phone and I'm on my new phone, but let me just check the sub thing. Oh. I spent half my night doing that. Um, to talk studio. Hello, everyone coming in. Um, no, I don't want to battle. Um, subscription emotes. Oh, it's not saved them. It took me ages to do that. I'll do it when I come off. Let me write a note to myself. I bet you think I'm lying about doing the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mod joke. Um, my tree's up. Oh, I'm going to do mine this weekend. I've literally... Um, letters. Um, I've just um, ordered a new washing machine and um, tumble dryer because I just can't cope anymore going to, um, going to the laundrette all the time because it literally... It, there's too much washing between all the kids, so I just had to buy one. I literally thought I can't keep doing it. It's so expensive, the laundrette as well. I forgot to use the cash back app, Alicia. I was on the phone to my mum at the same time. She was trying to guide me. Um, someone told me you'd give me cash back. Um, <laughs> thank you for all the help, guys. Um, what did I say? The bin gate. I literally, I, when I come live this afternoon, we went live about my bins for an hour. Um, I had two bins. Now I have five bins of rubbish. And I walked all the way to the church, right? <laughs> I walked all the way to the church with two bins. And... He's got a cane corso running around the fucking yard. So then I couldn't go into the garden because I didn't want to die. And it was chasing a laser beam on the floor. Um, so I was literally like, had to walk all the way home with them before I picked Tori up from school. So now I've got five bags of rubbish because Tegan's inside her room. And I went to Aldi so I had to get rid of all the old like vegetables and fruit and stuff. So now I'm in an even worse predicament. I've been wheelie bin out on the curb. They've not been yet. They did say it might take 24 hours and they might not even come because uh, my mum said they take photos on the front of the bin and they're not even going to know I lied. And it's going to take 10 days to get a new bin bag. So tomorrow I'm going to have to go out again. To, and I can't do it in night autumn. I live in a really dangerous place. Thank you, Sally. Um, someone's... Actually, it might be good. Someone, thanks, Sally. Someone might actually steal them off me, which might be good. <laughs> I'll stand them with all five bags hoping someone robs me. Um, I might have to. So my granddad's funeral is on the 19th now. So I do know my granddad's funeral now. It's made me feel a little bit better. Thank you, Jasper. I was paranoid it was going to be on the 24th, my dad's anniversary. And I kept thinking, like, I can't do them both at the same time. Um, so I've got five days in between each now, which is not much better. But still, it is what it is. Um, yeah. Why do people keep trying to battle me? Stop. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I wanted to do uh, a quick Sarah Sharif update because I couldn't get on today. Um... I'm fine, Mrs. Khan. Thank you, Mummy. Um, <laughs> I never dry my hair. Thank you, Trisha. Um, sorry. Um, sorry, Sharif. Hi, Ellie, saw your vid. Which video, Lazy Princess? I've done quite a few today. Um, I'm well spicy today. Um, um, Sarah, yeah, I've done quite a few. I've got a whole playlist. Hey, Evil Lou, I've got a whole playlist about um, Sarah. The only update I haven't done is from today. Um, so I'm just going to quickly thank you, Dem Dem. Thank you for all the comment clouds, guys. Um, leave me alone. <laughs> um, I don't tell my mum I've got my hair either. So it says um, in the update for Sarah Sharif, obviously her father spoke more today. Hi, oh my God. Um, he said the stepmother had always been possessed like someone had done black magic on her and even members of her family have said look don't try to leave her or upset her because she's not quite all there thank you for helping these guys sarah's body was found with dozens of injuries blah blah, blah but we don't know all that part because i've gone through that countless times with you guys hey h um thank you for the ladybugs so it says um given evidence mr sharif told jurors that miss patel was abusive towards him and that her own family had said that she was a problem She's very crazy when she goes into that mindset. She doesn't know when to stop. Her family would come and say, do not leave her. She is possessed like someone has done black magic on her. He also, thank you for the sub. She also, he also denied ever beating Sarah, saying there was not a single incident with him, with the children when he was at home. It would always happen when he wasn't there. 
Everything has happened at home while I was at work. Jurors were told Mr. Sharif's case was that Miss Patul had, was responsible for Sarah's death, all the beatings, and he had made a false confession on the phone and also in the note to protect his wife. Mr. Sharif told the court he was cursing himself for leaving Sarah's body behind like an orphan after traveling to Pakistan. And they also used for evidence two videos he had recorded on his phone showing his wife abusing him. One from 2016, where she will not let him get out of the house and she keeps twisting his hands and then she kicks him. And in the video, you can hear him saying, you're pushing me and I'm going to use this evidence against you. So if we note that down, that's 2016. And in the second recording filmed in June of 2019, um, she can be heard rushing towards him. He's saying, let go, leave me alone. And then he is seen escaping through the family kitchen window. Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry, but this man is the biggest coward I've ever encountered in my life. Like, can you imagine him climbing out the fucking kitchen window? Um, because you were that scared and terrified of this woman and you knew that she was that crazy that you were going to work for 10, 12 hour shifts and leaving her alone with your children, including a baby who was one years of age. Um, so you weren't that fucking terrified of her or at the very least you were able to swap your children into your place um, to take that abuse because you knew what she was capable of. Um, and we have to remember as well that, that his fingerprints were on the carrier bags that had been over Sarah's head. His fingerprints were on the tape that was used to tie them. Thank you guys for the heart and gifts. Um, women, 100% Susie, can be abusers too. The fact of the matter is, if you know somebody is abusing your children and torturing your children, it's not a get out of jail free card to say, well, once she was mean to me as well. Um, that's not that, the same as if it was a man abusing a woman and you know that he is burning and beating and biting your children. It's not a get out of free jail free card to say, well, I'm not going to stop because I know she can get a bit nasty. It's your job as a father um, to do something and you could escape out of the kitchen window. Sarah couldn't because she had a broken spine, broken ribs, broken hands, broken fingers. So she couldn't do that. She couldn't leave. Um, and that that's what I'm saying. Like, I understand and I accept and I stand up for male victims all the time. And I, I, I address the fact it's becoming an increasing problem. And it's sometimes doubly hard for men because they can't even tell that they're being abused because people ridicule them. And there's a whole thing of being a man, being stronger. I get it. But in this case, I don't really give a shit that she twisted your hands. I don't really give a shit that she called your names. And I don't really give a shit that she had hit you with a lemon squeezer once because what she did to Sarah was far worse and you didn't stop it as her father. But Nash Patul had no rights to Sarah. She wasn't a, a parent for Sarah. She wasn't someone who could have got custody, should have been around her and you were her birth father and it was your job to protect your daughter. And I don't believe for a second that he didn't take part in this abuse at all. At the very least, he saw what happened and did nothing. He told jurors again that he arrived home to find Sarah limp on the 8th of August before attempting CPR and begging for an ambulance to be called. And he was told by his partner in Urdu or Punjabi, leave it, she's dead. And he said, look, she wouldn't let me call an ambulance. She wouldn't let me do CPR. I'd like to know how she stopped him at that point. Um, because if I needed to give CPR to my child, 10 men couldn't stop me doing it. So that's what he kind of spoke about today, about how she was kind of... Um, she had kind of been under some kind of black magic. Thank you, Briggsy. She was wild. Um, so we're going to talk about something else that, that he said today, which makes me hate him far worse. Um, so he said that Sarah Sharif, his daughter, had made his life hell for 18 months before she was killed. Erfan Sharif said his wife would accuse Sarah of misbehaving while he was at work, saying that she had cut up his, cut up his shoelaces and clothes and hidden his keys. But Sharif said he had never witnessed this behavior from his daughter, but he had accepted that, that, that the stepmother was telling the truth. And because of this, it made his life hell. And he said at the same time he knew Batul was being crazy and was being abusive and he did nothing to stop it. And when asked if he had 
beat Sarah ever or had been responsible for her death. He says, I wasn't at home. You came home, you saw the injuries, you saw the burns, the bite marks. You saw that she had carrier bags taped to her head, that she was taped and tied to heating pipes in the house, which was causing her severe blistering of her legs. Um, he, he and his wife are both complicit in this, as is the uncle. There were three adults in a home who should have put the children in the home first. Children should be loved, protected and never hurt. And children's home should be their safe space. And if, as any parent in here, and I will say to every single one of you, if you ever feel like, okay, so you are not coping or you cannot provide a safe space for your child, it is up to you to put them in another place of another care because there is never a time in the world where it needs to get to a stage where you are biting, beating, breaking bones of a child. There is there is no place in society for that. So yes, Lee, in a minute. Um, if you feel that she's possessed and dangerous, why are you going to work every day? Um, hey, Jamie, why are you going to work every day and, and leaving the children in the house with someone who you believe is in a whole other world? My kids were friends. 100% miss. Like, honestly, most women who go through DV, myself included, we provide a still a nice life for our children. We protect the children even from what's going on in the house. We do everything we can as mothers. There is never a time where I ever felt that anyone was going to hurt my children, was going to smack my children, scream at my children, any of those things. If there ever had been, it would have ended that day. And I can promise you it would have ended that day. So in these clips where you can see like he's saved purposely to one day use his evidence, it's a shame that he wasn't also filming the evidence that was what was happening to Sarah and the injuries to Sarah and providing that to Child Protective Services or even getting Sarah into your taxi cab, driving her to her mother's home and leaving her there and saying, you take her because I can't keep her safe. There were so many other possibilities and options here. And Irfan is an absolute coward. And for him to try and say, like, I was a victim as much as Sarah because once she hit me with a broom, it's not really the same, Irfan. You didn't go through even 0.0.0.9% of what, what Sarah did. And no one really cares about your story because you allowed your child to be killed and Sarah is the only victim here. And the fact that you're using Sarah's murder trial in order to um, push a narrative of like, well, she was mean to me once or twice, um, it makes me hate you even more. Sharif, uh, Sharif told the jurors that Batul slapped him and I tried to leave, but she locked the front door. So I jumped through the kitchen window. When asked why he made the recordings, he said, she's very, very crazy. When she goes into that mindset, she doesn't stop at all. She doesn't care about anything or anyone at that point. When asked why he did not end the relationship, he said, her family used to come to me a lot and tell me not to leave. She used to tell me how much she loved me. Her family told me she was possessed. Someone has done black magic on her. And most of the time she's good, but when she goes mad, no one can stop her. Um, Sharif was also asked about the WhatsApp messages he had sent to Batul, which she had forwarded as a screenshot to her sisters. In the text, he said, both of you have made my life hell. Neither her or you can be trusted, meaning the stepmother and Sarah. You've both caused hell for people who love you and care for you. I'm done with you now, but it'll be her turn if she does anything silly. Sharif told jurors the messages referred to Batul and Sarah. He said he had been sent it because Sarah was being accused of being naughty and Batul was abusive. He wept as he added, I love Banash from the first day and I love Sarah because she was my daughter. But always something was going on when they were together. <sighs> Sharif also accused Batul of being the driving force between the decision to take Sarah out of home. Was this planned by you to keep Sarah from school because she was so badly bruised and he said no sir he then went on to tell the court that he had spent seven thousand five hundred and sixty pounds buying Batul gold bangles for her birthday just four weeks before sarah was murdered like why why are you even bringing that up like honestly you piece of shit do you think any amount of gold you've bought that evil bitch who you knew was abusing your daughter um at least partly or totally why bring that up in the court like you're proud of it? Well, I was away from, away from the house. I couldn't save Sarah a lot because I was earning money to buy her gold bangles. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. 
Like, we don't care what you bought her. If anything, it looks like you've contributed towards paying someone to end the life of Sarah Sharif at this point. The fact that you're bringing it up um, in the courtroom shows that actually you weren't enemies with, with Banash. You weren't someone who was constantly hating her, wishing she would leave. You weren't someone who was constantly like, oh, she's 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 had all these things done to her and she's crazy. You were actually saving quite a large sum of money in order to gift her. So what you've done there is you've actually proven um, that actually she was your partner and your partner in crime. Because who in the world is, is buying any gifts? I don't care about the price for somebody who is is injuring your child to the point of torture. It makes no sense. It seems to be Sarah that bore the brunt of it. Like he says, you know, it was Sarah that made my life hell for 18 months. Like all I ever heard was that she had been naughty and she had done this and she had done that. So I just had a problem with her. And that's why I'm sending text messages saying it'll be her turn soon. Um, he is a cretin. He's an absolute cretin. Um, as is Banash and I can't wait till she comes on the stand and she will as well play victim. Um, it's nearly £8,000 worth, Shannon. I'm not really sure. Mm. It was her dad that's been on the stand for the last two days. I don't even believe, Laser, that she's pointed in mine. I definitely think that she's she's played scenarios to make him kind of join her. Um but a love from a parent should should never be able to be poisoned by someone else. That there isn't a poison strong enough that should be able to turn a love and protection that a mother or father has towards their child, just because, just be, just because you know, um, someone's telling you stuff. You know, you should. My instant reaction of, of a stepfather who was constantly telling me how horrendous my child would be, like, there's the door. Out you go. Um, it just what ten year old really is causing that many issues in the house that it's ruining your life. It's literally causing you like you said, she she destroyed my life for eighteen months. She made my life hell. You know, I'm sorry that you had to come home for eighteen months and witness different injuries and abuse that have been done to your daughter. I'm sure that really did ruin your life. Um, not enough, though, that you actually did something to to protect her. His wife definitely was a driving force. But, but, you know, everyone said, like, the abuse started when he was at work. The neighbours only heard the abuse when when he was at work and Banash was in the house on her own with the children. But you cannot ever neglect to notice the level of injury that Sarah Sharif had. And her injuries were in different stages of healing. So there had been a long time where she'd had fractures to her body burns to her body bites to her body like no one cannot see those things you can't hide bruises all over their face you obviously definitely can't hide a child sat there with carry bags tied around her head with duct tape what 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 did he what did he think was going on um so many chances to save her um and like i said yesterday i would have had so much more respect for her fan if he, he she's in the uk um if he'd stood up on the trial and said Regardless of who did what to Sarah, I was her father, I should have protected her, and I am responsible for the death of Sarah Sharif. And I fled as a coward, and I should have done more, and I should have protected her, and I didn't. Don't make excuses or try to pursue a way out of it or, or blame black magic and all of this, almost like you're giving Banash a, a way out now, like everyone knew she had black magic done on her. Um, she, she's just evil, and some people are just evil. People sometimes start to hurt children and get a power trip from it. And it leads to worse and worse injuries and more and more calculated abuse. They start planning ways of like what 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 would what would bring about more pain. And that is someone who Banesh definitely is. She's someone who enjoyed what she did because they upped their game so many times, took her out of school, hid her away from people. Um, Sarah was constantly beaten. It wasn't someone who did something to Sarah, she had a bruise on her face and was felt really, really guilty. It was another six months till something happened. And again, she was like, my temper's getting the best of me. This is someone who was escalating in her behaviour to pin down a child. Thank you, Scoot. Thank you, Fiona. Um, thank you for all the gifts, guys. To pin down a child and use a boiling hot household appliance and iron on both of her buttocks while she would have screamed and it would have taken at least two adults to do it. Um, that's not somebody who has flipped, snapped, You've waited for it to heat up. You've done all of those things. 
you've waited for the kettle to to boil when you've poured scalding water on her there's there's a massive escalation in an enjoyment of abuse and they cannot sit there and say oh sarah did this sarah did that like you've done this and it doesn't matter which one of you carried out the acts you all knew they were happening and no one did anything nobody in this situation saved her Thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks, Jasper. We see it all, it's not just in child abuse, in domestic abuse, in any kind of abuse, things often escalate because you're not getting the same rush from doing the same thing. So you 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 think of different ways, you plan different ways. Um, and unfortunately, that's what it is. I can't repeat it all now because we've got other cases to move on to. And um, I have just come on to do an update. I will update tomorrow at four again, and I will go through what we've just talked about now for people who are just coming to the daytime lives. Neighbours did hear Janice. The neighbours, um, at least six neighbours have been in court and said, we heard, we heard the screaming, we heard the shouting, we heard all the things going on, we heard children trying to get out of rooms and, and they, they didn't say anything, they didn't report it. Um, hello? Oh, it's behind me. Um, I don't know if her both might have brain injuries. I know that at one point she had... Um, addiction issues and she she said she'd been through domestic abuse i think the police had kind of accepted there'd been domestic abuse on both sides with sarah's mother and father um and at one time the court got involved and gave sarah and her brother to her father and said her mum had to kind of work on herself before she could have the children back hello i keep hearing people rustling around who was worse than mothers they're both the same in my opinion whether you are committing horrific acts of abuse against a child or you're allowing it to happen um you're the same but i do believe it was led in in part by the stepmother the stepmother hated sara sharif we don't know sammy at least not to the extent that um sara was he was still going to school and stuff like that no it's it's one of the kids coming down to gets me out of the school bag i think and then we're going back upstairs i don't know if she had a brain injury let me have a quick look at them i'll see you later tegan oh she's not come down oh cool thank you see you later um Thank you, Kim. Let's have a look. So let's all say something. Um, no, it says Sarah had the brain injuries, which we know. I can't see anything about her mum. Um, you know what's coming up? Oh, it's, it's Tegan's boyfriend. Um, where are the other kids now? I'm going to go and lock the front door now he's gone because I just get worried that someone will come in while I'm lying. Oh. Um, let me just move this chair back because it feels really uncomfortable. Social services were involved to the extent that um, the, the dad got custody and stuff, but we know that they didn't do anything or they didn't get involved when the school reported some of the bruises. They kind of said, and they closed the case that I even seeing Sarah. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Crayons. Thank you guys for the gifts and helping my gift goal. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Sarah Shreve more tomorrow. And I'll put the latest stuff into a video tomorrow morning um, to add to the playlist. Just to keep people up to date with what's going on in the trial. School seen her three times with different bruises, Shaz. And on the third time, they did report it to social services. Social services closed the case without seeing her. And then school said, we're not going to continue with the safeguarding because they've taken her out of school. She's not a problem anymore. Um, and it seemed for the majority of her life, Sarah Shreve was never anyone's problem, um, including her neighbours, her teachers, the school in general, social services, her own mother. Um, it seemed like everyone decided that Sarah Sharif was not their problem. No, siblings aren't back from Pakistan without seeing her. Um, thank you, Sammy. It's nice to be back at home. I can't wait to decorate for Christmas and stuff like that. Um, it will be nice. She was definitely jealous of Sarah. Sarah was like young, beautiful, vivacious. Um, she was well-spoken. She was the first to kind of put herself forward for anything. She had confidence. She loved playing the guitar. She loved singing. She had a real kind of future ahead of her. And she had a mixture of like Pakistani really good looks mixed with Polish from her mum, like the, the European side of her. Um, so she was stunning and she was she was literally so outgoing and, and friendly and just eventually she just kind of wittered down and then was just taken out of society and it just seemed like everyone kind of gave up why do you think they single out one sibling 
normally if a child is slightly harder work so maybe they have some kind of ADHD autism they take slightly more work they don't go to sleep as easy as the other they become a focus of hatred and it can be anything like just one child could be a breeze easy to be around just just easier and so a child becomes like the focus and like I said before some adults enjoy it they enjoy it and they and they kind of fixate on it and it becomes like a real tug of war sometimes if it's a new relationship it's the child that the parents could particularly no problem so if we only just start to about Sarah Sharif a little bit it could be the parent is slightly closer to a child or looks more like the the birth mother and a new woman comes along it could be just anything like it's not really to say it was one particular thing would be like putting it on the child like oh it's because of that it's just often whatever goes on in their head you know I think um Arthur say look baby Arthur he wasn't really baby but Arthur Hughes Lambino Hughes his stepmother begun to really hate him because he kept asking for his mum and she was twisted up by the fact that dad had ever had a relationship and he was the only child that wasn't hers so she was going to put it all onto Arthur and she made him out to be horrific and the only thing he'd done is ask for his mum who was in prison like children do so it's just kind of, Lindsay, I will continue doing it. I will continue to, I think, every single person in the UK knows, knows Sarah's story because people do need to. And baby P as well. Um, he was young, so he would have taken the most attention off the mum. And once he, be, we don't know how much he looked like his father because we don't know who baby P's father is. So it, it can be anything. Like, sick people are sick people. It's just... Um, horrific not every step parent no but you have to be more aware you definitely have to be more aware the statistics of um abuse physical abuse um also sexual abuse as you get step parents in the family those 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 statistics just skyrocket then when you have other adults in the house who are not even step parents but like step parents you, you just keep you just keep up in the statistics so that's why I always say to people, like, keep your children's social circle very small when it comes to adults. How much time do you think Sarah's killers will get? I hope they get a whole life tariffs, but I don't see it happening. Um, baby fear, yeah. Baby fear, Nicole Blaine. You know, that was that was a an issue of, of the father not wanting to be with her at the time. And the anger and rage because she'd had this other baby to attract a man. Yet again, um, she couldn't cope the children she already had. She should never be able to have another child. And I, I, do, I do want to literally, I do want to just pay homage for a minute because there are amazing step parents out in the world, okay? And I am a girl who's had a stepfather, I get emotional, but since I was six, who played the role of father far better than my own father did. And he is still to this day my father and my children's grandpa. And he didn't have to do that. He took on four of us children from very young and he turned up to my last day of school he held my hand while I lost my baby he has been there when I've had children he has saved me from domestic abuse I get emotional he's given me my brother and sister and if I needed something right now and I phoned him he would be here in seconds and if I needed to tell something that I didn't want to quite tell my mum I would phone him um and he is a really, really great guy. And he's never hurt us. He's never done anything that I would think was weird. He sold his car when he was when we were like much younger to buy my sister a birthday present. He's given everything for us kids. So I really don't want people to think I'm saying step parents should always be watched. Like my stepdad is 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 my rock man and has been. And my children don't know any different than that he's their grandpa. Um, so I don't want people to think, you know. My dad, one of my dad's last things was to, to, to acknowledge the fact that you've been the dad I should have been and I wasn't. So I don't want people to think that, you know, Soph's in here, Soph, one of my mods, she is a stepmother to two children that aren't hers as well. And she treats them just like her own children. Like there is a lot of people out there um, who do that. So I don't want people to think, oh, it's always a step parent. It's, it's not always a step parent. It's, sometimes it's the parent. Sometimes it's the grandparent. Thank you, Esther. So Please don't judge everyone because we've got one evil set parent here. Children are dying at the rate of nothing because of parents. We have a two-year-old child missing in America right now whose mum has admitted that she sold her to a drug dealer and the child is still missing and there's Amber Alerts going out in America as we speak because 
the mum wanted drugs more than she wanted her child. Um, I've seen at least two cases in the last 12 months where the child has ended up dead in the drug dealer's care after horrific things have been done to them. One was two, one was four. And now we have another child missing tonight um, because her mum gave her to a criminal drug dealer. And that's a birth mother. So please know that when I cover these cases, I cover them from all, all parts of the world. And you know what? Hardly, hardly ever are these cases the work of, of a stranger and I want people to know that because I think people think about it all the time yeah but maybe it's this maybe it's seldom is it a stranger frantic search for a young girl whose mother handed her over to a drug dealer in Oklahoma so I, I hope to God that she is it's just um doesn't bear thinking about a woman today has been arrested on facebook because she tried to sell a baby for 150 dollars it was a mum and dad who were on um trial soon because they sold their baby for a pitcher of beer a jug of beer um in a pub so not yet alana um so and i, I just give those examples to say like these aren't set parents so you know we must give step parents are heroes right they're like heroes that don't wear capes because they don't have to be a parent and a lot of the time they are a better parent than the real parent any updates on liam so liam we know that he should be back in the uk now his body at least he his friend one of his friend who please found weird text messages on his phone his home has been raided in argentina we think it is roger norris but we don't know for sure thank you esther and two of the drug dealers all the people from the hotel they believe sold in the drugs have had their homes raided again tonight um there is mad rumors going around on tiktok tonight that liam is in witness protection and they have proof of this they know where he is and who he's with and stuff but i would always say unless you can show me your evidence i'm not going to listen um you know you can't you can't fake the grief of that dad, um, Liam's dad, and the way that he was. Um, they've already been raided some of these places, and it was only the um, once text messages between the friend forensically have linked, linked on the phone. They've 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 linked they've raided a friend's house. They said the friend wasn't there when they raided the home. That's the only updates I have on that. Um, will Liam have an op autopsy here? I assume probably most of the time, if someone dies abroad, the Home Office insist on one. Um, especially when it's a bit of a, a strange one. Kaz, me and my mom have been in the live trying to say, like, why are you doing this? He's got a son. Um, I contacted the um, content creator and said, is there any way you could send me a picture of, of what you're talking about so I can have a look? Because or just provide where you found that from. Um, they didn't want to do that. They said, no, but it's ours. And I said, OK, um, it's a bit of a sticky one in it because um, yesterday you said you weren't going to talk about it anymore because you'd been threatened and today you're outwing him in witness protection which could if he was in witness protection you've just kind of put his life in danger and if he's not you've just started a horrific rumor um where a family are just kind of grieving tonight um so this is a problem with true crime online right and i'll take my part in it yeah because when you're a true crime creator this tends to happen same with the jay slater case right there's loads of things in the jay slater case loads of questions still to be asked and i think about going live all the time and just telling you the things i know and what questions need to be asked but at the same time, there is five or six profiles online who are saying that Jay Slate is alive, he's an IB for, he's partying it up, he's breaking through doors. So it all gets really murky. So if I put out a video like that where I'm telling you the truth, people are like, stop doing this to the family because there's madness. He's not alive. He's not in this grave. So, so things get really murky. So you kind of just hold off a little bit because I don't want to do any damage, right? But at the same time, Warren's waiting for content creators to kind of give him information and watching people's videos and stuff. So you want to be able to do it, but at the same time, you don't. Same with Liam Payne, yeah. There's definitely some weird things there. There's definitely some people who are culpable in Liam's death, whether it's murder or some kind of accident that's happened because no one's looked after him, the hotel haven't done the right thing. There's definite questions to be asked there. But what you do is when sometimes when you all of a sudden make it big on social media, you like get a million views on a video or something that becomes quite addictive right so you think oh i got a million views on a video about liam so i need to make another video about liam i don't really have much to say so i'm gonna make this up right or i'm gonna pick an idea from my ass and i'm gonna 
thank you Esther, make it look like it's it's real. And when by the time people realise it's not, um, you've already made money off a million views and you've kind of fed your ego there. But at the same time, you're ruining your reputation and the previous videos you've done have actually been very good because you need to feed that. Like I could make videos about Jay Slater all, all day long like Mariana does and just keep telling you weirdness. I could I could be going, look at Brad's second toe. He looks like a murderer. Is that a teardrop on his cheek? Um, social media can be addictive, right? And when you log on one day and you see I've got 5,000 new followers, you're like, that's awesome. And then it slows down and some weeks you get 30 followers and next week you get 500. It's just one of those things. But when you lose the the morals behind it of only putting out things you factually believe at that time and i'm not always going to be right if i'm telling you this is a theory it's a theory like it's what i believe at that moment could be a possibility but you have to be bearing in mind like that there are people online right like especially tonight who are grievingly and worldwide who don't particularly want to see things like that thank you mills and there's a family and there's a little boy and, and like you know there's all of those things. It's become, when it becomes, I'm not even just talking about her particularly, when something, a one subject becomes your whole content, you start panicking, so you start putting out mad videos. And that's just my opinion. Like, people keep saying to me, when are you going to say something about Jay Slater when I'm sure about something? Like, I, I could put something out today and say, I had a picture sent to me last night, it's 100% Jay Slater, and he's with Michael Jackson, and they're fucking paddleboarding. But, unless I can provide you with that photo, like I'm making that video, yes, it will get a million views when I put Jay Slater paddleboarding Michael Jackson as the head in, but it's bollocks, it's bollocks. So what what's the point? Like you have to get views for the right thing. You have to get views like put out a video about a case and be like, I hope people watch that because I want people to know who this victim is. And when you lose that, you lose yourself and, and then you just, you lose your morals. And now we can do some cases if people want to. Um, thank you, Lou, for the heart me. Um, what are we going to talk about? Ooh, yeehaw, thank you, Marie. Um, and thank you. Was it Marie or Maria? Thank you. Um, thank you, Lulabella. Any update on Olivia? None that I've seen so far. I mean, if anyone can repost my video about missing Olivia, she's 14, she's been missing since Halloween night. It's a week tomorrow. And the police have only put out an appeal today. Um, she's 14. Can we do the paranormal one? I do have a paranormal case tonight, actually. Um, it's a bit of a weird one, but sometimes I just want to break from, like, the horrific ones about children and stuff. So I thought tonight I'm going to do just sort of a bit of a bitty one where I've got a couple of mad cases, cases but none of them involve the, the death of a child, which I think we all need a break from. Um, her name's Olivia. She's missing from the Southampton area, and she's been missing for six days. Um, oh, has he got a new video up today? I'll have a look afterwards. Um... So I have a couple of things written down here. I've researched about six cases and I'm not doing them all tonight because it's already late, but I'll just do whatever we've got time for. Um, yeah. So one that's a bit, one that's called Possessed by Evil, which is the title of the case. And we're going to talk about that, which is off the back of someone doing like an Ouija board and not closing down the gates um, and just bad things happening. But it has been like proven that a lot of things happened. So I think we'd cover that one. Um, I also have the crossbow killer. Someone asked me to do earlier, so I do have that one. We can get into that one, do it today or tomorrow. We've got one, how a psychic actually solved a case. Because I'm always quite... I always like to think that that we could be using... We did that once. Oh, no, Jessie. Um, just share that. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Anyone who can repost the missing person cases. I don't normally ask people to repost my videos because of views purposes. But if you see a missing person's case, if you can comment at least five words and repost them then you'll they'll get out to your following thank you carol which means if you live closer to the area than me you'll you'll probably hit in those places and if you live anywhere in the kind of same areas please just download the video and go put it on your facebook and places like that because this is the only way we're going to find these people i live in devon so sometimes if i'm putting on my facebook unless they're anywhere near devon it's not helpful but i really hope they find her as well i just can't believe we waited six days for an appeal um hey boy you're right so welcome new mods we've got We've got Hattie, we have Jojo, we have Jen Bob. Welcome to the mod team. I have offered it to one other person, Amanda, but I, she, I haven't heard back from her yet and I don't know if she's in the live now. Um, 
and that's all we'll have for now but Hattie, Gem Bob and um, Jojo all have the ability to let you into the Discord. They made you a little bit of help for it, but they can still definitely help. Um, just the more people get in the lives, it's just more helpful to have mods because people have got lives as well. They can't always be here. Thank you, Tracy, for the boxing glove. So, yeah. And over the next couple of weeks, I might pick some more because I think having a full mod team is the only way to move forward, really, because then people can not worry so much when they can't be here. Um, thank you for helping me, guys. Thank you so much. Oh, Amanda, you were... The Amanda... Oh, decline. Amanda with a Scottish flag, it was you that I messaged to ask to be a mod. I, I tagged you in um in the Discord, but I didn't hear back from you. Um, Amanda with a Scottish flag. Um, but I don't know if you want to be a mod or not. If you can, then I did tag you. Um, uh, turn off, I don't want battles. Um, yeah, so let me know. Um, I was expecting slightly more than yeah, Amanda. No, <laughs> I was expecting a whole a whole written page um, and some emotes. Um, let me... Amanda, are you not a sub? Because how did I tag you in the Discord if you're not in there? How's it going with Manjaro? I, I, I got my... Um, let me just add a bond rating for Amanda. Um, I am doing the right thing. I thought I was going to meet you then. I am... Um, I found the, the secret dose. I found the pen in the bin um, and I managed to get it out. And except I was expecting her to say, oh, we'd be honoured. Um, <laughs> um, it's probably because it's a pinned comment. I can't see it. Um, yeah, so I managed to get my secret dose out because I need. I haven't had one this week because it's run out. So that's good. Anyway, cases. Come through. Let's go. Cool. Mm. Let's get a picture up um, for the case we're talking about first. We'll start with a bit of a creepy case now, the um, possession one, because then right before bedtime, I'm not freaking people out. I know, Amanda. Um, I had to try and pull it out really forcefully, then I used my teeth a little bit. Um, Amanda, if you remind me in the Discord after the live, I'll move you into the mod folders, but um, I was waiting for you, um, you to answer back before I did it. Jump scare. So in this case, we're going to um, Madrid in Spain, and it is the case of Estefania Gutierrez Lazaro, 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 Lazaro. Yeah, um, it's not too bad, Emma. Like I hate horror, and I got through researching it, so it's just um, it's just a bit of a different one. It's not um, overly terrifying, to be fair. And if you haven't been messing with Ouija boards, this won't happen to you. That's all I can say. Um, so leave them alone. So the idea that one's body can be taken over by an entity whose will far exceeds that of his host is absolutely terrifying. This phenomenon is as rare as it may be, allegedly occurred in Madrid, Spain in 1990. The events were set in motion when a young girl's attempt to contact the dead opened up a door into predatory evil bent on taking everything from her, including her mortal soul. 18-year-old, 18, man, Estefania Gutierrez Lazaro was a typical teenager in every sense. She went to school, hung out with her friends and was a devoted sister to the five siblings that she had. Now, she obviously would look, at, hey, Shan, she would look after her siblings while her parents were at work. So she had a lot to do with them. She was the oldest one. Like I said, 18. Hey, from Ireland. So she was trusted to do that job. Curious by nature, the devout Catholic girl had developed a mild interest in the occult. And as she approached adulthood, she began to look more and more into it. Thank you guys for all the heart me. Hey, Stephanie. And intrigued by the idea that spirits could be contacted after they left this world, she managed to craft her own Ouija board out of materials found around the home. What well, started as an innocent project of curiosity would be the beginning of the end for Estefania. Thank you, guys. As it happened, one of Estefania's classmates had recently suffered the loss of her boyfriend, thank you, in a motorcycle accident. After learning of the tragedy, she brought the Ouija board to school, thinking this would be the perfect opportunity to put it to the test. 
Estefania gathered up two of her closest friends and told them her plan to communicate with the dead and try to contact this boy who had been killed. They agreed to participate, not really believing anything would happen. What should have been a harmless lark would quickly evolve into something more horrifying than anyone could have imagined. Things got underway during the lunch break. The girls congregated in a field not far from the school with the Ouija board in hand. Using an upside down glass as a planchette, they began the ritual. Yes, yeah, same Jenny. I've been to... Um, Janine, sorry. I've been to many mediums. There's no way I'd fuck with you like this. Oh, Nikki. Almost immediately, the planchette, I think if that's a planchette, I think that's how I'm saying it right. I'm not really um, a expert in these fields, which is the, the glass that you're moving it around. Amanda, stop. Um, began gliding across the letters with little help from the participants. Yeah, that's right. Oh, it is right. I thought colour, but that's not right. Within moments, the glass had flown off the board and landed on the ground. Before anyone could react, a nun who taught at the school put an end to the activity. Furious at what she was seeing, she grabbed the board and ripped it in half. As she did so, the girls present claimed a wisp of smoke had risen from the remnants and disappeared inside of Esfania. As a result of the interruption, the connection with the other side had not been closed. With the board destroyed beyond repair, any hope of rectifying that situation was lost forever. Unbeknownst to them at the time, they had allowed an unclean spirit to remain on this realm. As a result, it had taken up residence inside of Esfania, the perfect vessel. Hey, Moonlight. What's the noise in the kitchen? What? What are you doing? Drinking. Why, why is it loudly? I don't know. Oh. Um, so what is it? Because she owns the board and opened it, so it would likely go for her the others. Is that how it works? It is creepy stuff, but like I said, if, you, if you're not messing with things like that, then it's, it's never going to happen to you. Um, so, within days of the incident, the teenager began experiencing vivid hallucinations. She claimed the dark figures were stalking her within the walls of the family home. The, they tormented her endlessly, especially in the hours when everyone else was sleeping. To add to her woes, Esfania, who had never had any significant health issues, began experiencing grand mal seizures. During these fits, her eyes rolled over completely white as she thrashed about wildly. Her once delicate features would become so contorted that she would no longer be recognised to those around her. Estefania, who had always been a loving and devout sister, began inc becoming increasingly aggressive towards those that she once cuddled. Without warning, she would drop to all fours in the presence of her brothers and sisters and begin barking until they ran away in fear. The sudden changes in their daughter's personality prompted her parents to seek medical intervention. Oh, Andreen, that's good to know. I literally am. Um, I still won't be doing it. <laughs> we do ghost hunts. Wow. Their efforts prov provided useless. Physicians could find no explanation for her odd behaviour. Likewise, psych psychiatric examinations turned up nothing that would account for the alarming transformation. Plagued by insomnia that would keep her awake for days on end, Esfania's plight only worsened. In rare moments of clarity, she told her mother that cloaked figures appeared in her room at night time and beckoned her to join them. Summoning what little strength she had left, she had refused to comply. That terrified um, the terrified girl knew even in a comp thank you Abby even in a compromised state if she accompanied them there would be no coming back. So on the thirteenth of July, nineteen ninety one, the balloon moved next to me. Then I thought, for fuck's sake, I thought now it's in me. Oh, Toy's got my birthday balloons tied around my my chair, so every time I move, I look like I'm in up, um, like I'm about to take off. Luckily, I'm really heavy; it's not going to happen. But if you see me float, something weird has happened. Um, on July 13th, 1991, Estefania attacked her sister. The unprovoked attack had been so brutal that the victimised girl suffered a seizure as a result of the attack. It would prove to be one of Estefania's last days on earth. The next day she would die in a nearby hospital where she had been taken for observation following the violent outburst. Thank you, Kate. 
It was determined that her heart had stopped for unspecified reasons at the tender age of 18. Her death came six months after the incident in the schoolyard exactly. The loss of the young girl's life would not, however, be the end of the ordeal. Estefania's mother, Concepcion, Concepcion, she's, um, she can't be called Concepcion. <laughs> it's some kind of Madrid name, but it, it reads like Conception, so I'm just going to call her that. Um, Conception. Um, that's a weird choice of name, isn't it? It's Concep and then Sion, so I think it's Concepcion. <laughs> I'm just going to call her Connie um, and be kinder than her parents were. Connie noticed strange occurrences taking place inside the house in the days following her daughter's funeral. Agonising screams would arise from somewhere deep inside the, the apartment. Although she didn't see her, concept, Connie recognised the cries of being those of her deceased child, which would have been absolutely terrifying. Loud banging noises would often emanate from Estefania's bedroom just bang after bang after bang Connie's kind isn't it um, on occasion when the family were brave enough to investigate they would find the area in a state of disarray and I'm going to show you one of the pictures of what they would find um, in the room so this is one of the pictures from the actual scene don't call her Connie what's wrong with Connie is Connie... Why is Connie weird? I'm not like Connie Condom. Um, just like Connie. Um, so this would be from behind a closed door. Because um, that would stop conception. I like Connie. Connie's good. <laughs> Connie's the best we've got right now. Um, I love the name Connie. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, Connie's the commentator's name. Connie Softer. The girl who said don't call her Connie is called Connie. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was thinking, why? I quite like Connie. Um, okay, I literally thought, why? What have I said wrong? Um, literally, I'm going to screenshot her name and put it in the Discord in a minute and say to my mods, like, she was really called cool Conception, wasn't she? Um, so when they would investigate, they would find the room in complete, sorry, Connie, um, disarray. Belongings that, that had been their daughter's and, and that she had held dear was strewn carelessly around the room, smashed. The linens would be stripped from the bed and the curtains would be pulled down like it was awful. Fishing a bouncy ball out the toilet. Oh, Jamie, you go, girl. There was someone in um, Spain that used to do that, but with ping pong balls. <laughs> Sorry, Jamie. In, Estefan <laughs> in Estefania's bedroom, her soft voice would sometimes call out, Mama, Mama as if she was trying to communicate from beyond the grave. At other times, she could be heard whispering incoherently to anyone who might be listening. The sound of an old man's laughter could also be heard moving along the walls. The long-suffering parents and their remaining children lived in constant fear in their home that it was taken over by forces that seemed to grow stronger day by day. As the disturbances became more frequent, objects began moving about the home at their own volition. The sound of glass shattered in the middle of the night, often jolted the family from sleep, even though no source would ever be found. Lights in the apartment flickered on and off. A loud punching noise could be heard coming from inside the walls that sounded like someone was trying to come through the drywall. Doors would open on their own at any given time. The family, in an attempt to keep unwanted guests out, would push heavily furniture against the entryways before they went to sleep. Even when blocked by a sofa, the doors would fly open, sending the piece of furniture skidding across the room. Along with the constant barrage of noises and other explained happenings, the members of the household were also subjected to severe physical assaults. Estefania's mother claimed that there were times when she would be awakened by the sensation of hands moving up and down her body. Other family members reported being picked up by unseen hands and be thrown against the wall. On one occasion, a framed photograph of Estevania toppled off the table and caught fire and hit the floor. The flames quickly burned themselves out, revealing that the only image of the dead girl had been destroyed. The frame remained intact with no sign of damage. The female siblings recalled horrifying incidents in which dark shapes appeared in their bedroom and crawled along the floor towards them. The figures emitted loud groans as it made their way towards their beds, in spite of the fact it had no mouth. According to them, the face of the entity was completely blank, devoid of features, human or otherwise. 
I know. The girl screamed at the sight of the monstrosity as it inched even closer. When they did so, toys began flying off their shelves, this followed by a spectral shouting match that erupted from out of nowhere. The furious exchange ended abruptly when the abdomination slivered across the floor and would vanish into... You've seen this often? Carl, are you joking? Um, and vanished into thin air. One day while sitting on his deceased sister's bed, her little brother had been lifted up and tossed across the room in full view of his father, Maximo. With no logical way to explain what he had seen, the man collected his child and beat a hasty retreat. From then on, the room was off limits to the younger members of the family. Friends of the Gutierrez Lazaros validated many of their accounts. People had seen it all too often. They had witnessed shadows floating independently across the walls and the floors, the growling. They had seen objects set on fire and being moved from room to room without being touched by anyone. On November 27th, 1992, after more than a year and a half of this, the family reached out for help. It was on that night that Connie had awakened to find herself pinned to the bed by something she could not see. She fought with all her might against the force that was making it nearly impossible for her to breathe. The struggle woke her husband, which brought an end to the ordeal. Knowing that he could no longer turn a blind eye to the situation, Maximo broke down and phoned the police. My toxic trait is thinking I could fix him. What, the ghost? Well, Maximo, <laughs> I'm so confused. He told them without hesitation they were being besieged by ghosts. He feared that if he allowed it to go any longer, they would not make it out alive. When authorities... The ghost? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, have you been to prison? I'm in. Um, when authorities arrived at the scene of what they presumed was a nuisance call, they found the family waiting in the street. Despite the freezing temperatures, when asked by officers to accompany them inside, they refused. They said, no more, they're going back in. At this point, they were more afraid of what was inside the apartment than what, that, that what was on the outside or defying law enforcement. And the, Maximo even said, like, you can arrest me, but I will never go back in that house again. And it's weird because they'd been going for it for so long and things had been like this for a long time. But it was almost like when they'd actually told someone, they were all of a sudden, like, overwhelmed. Conception is pronounced Conception. I'm just going to call her Connie. Um, it, the UK version of it is Connie. Um, and it's just easier for me. Throw me across the room, I'm yours. Growl at me, I'm done. Um, so yeah, they literally were like, no, we're not going back in. Officer Jose, I'm not going to say his last name because it does sound a bit like a slur, would later recount what he and his fellow agents experienced as they explored the home. Thank you, Michelle. It was when a locked door opened by itself and slammed shut as they entered one of the bedrooms they knew it'd be a night to remember while sitting on one of the beds in what had been estvania's room they heard a woman scream from the direction of the balcony i know it's um jose as well and just what did i say josie um i was too concentrated on his last name which i'm glad i didn't say and if i'd misspelled that one we would be cancelled so when spitting on the bed of one of the um in the room they heard screams from a woman coming from the balcony they rushed to the area but found it vacant after a search turned up nothing of significance they retreated back inside when they re-entered estefania's room they noticed many of the posters that decorated the walls bore long slash marks down them each in a sequence of three two of the men present became so nauseous they were forced to leave the residence Officers noted a marked drop in the temperature when they stepped into the bathroom that had been primarily used by Estefania. They likened it to walking into a deep freezer. They would later learn from the family that this was an area of the apartment where much of the paranormal occurrences had taken place. The specific location was so active, in fact, they believed it was gathering place for evil spirits. As agents searched the room, a crucifix that had been hanging on one of the walls suddenly flew off the wooden plaque and landed on the floor at their feet. When the mount was examined, three claw marks were evident in the spot where the uh, crucifix had been before. I don't know why I keep doing this. Jose recalled that officers had seen a dark figure watching them from the hallway as they worked. When they attempted to approach the observer, there was no one there. In one room, brown goo oozed from a tablecloth as the stunned officers looked on. The policemen who were present that night knew they were in over their heads. Their extensive training had not prepared them for what they experienced in that apartment. Although they understood the family's concerns, they could not help. They were not qualified to deal with this. They dealt with criminals, not paranormal. 
Thank you, guys. The family wanted nothing more than to return to the lives they had once known. They longed to have their daughter back, but they knew such a thing could never be. The only solution, as they saw it, was to cut their loss and get out while they still could. Um, I, I, you can't cover her face. I actually have a picture of um, an Ouija board. Um, a Ouija board. That's all, that's all I can give you um, right now. I'll have to watch an episode of Gilmore Girls after this. I'm going to watch some Homer Simpson. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so they decided to pick up and move out. Following their relocation, no further disturbances were noted. A sense of normalcy returned to the family that they thought they would never find. Um, <laughs> that my head went absolutely fucking weird then. Um, their newfound peace would not last. With their, without their knowledge, someone had leaked Espania's story to the media. The family did not want the contact with with the public they didn't want to bring it back out they didn't want to talk about it and they really did feel like by talking about it they could bring it back into their lives and kind of tempt this fate again so they really did not want to talk about it there is a small very important detail that i've left out of this case so far early in 1990 connie got word that her estranged father was on his deathbed so Espania's grandfather, even though they had never been close, she felt it was only right that along with her children, they go and see him before he died and paid their final respects. It was a gesture born of what was right, a sense of obligation towards a familiar kind of connection, a familial connection. Thank you, Linda. And the fact it was her father. Now, Estefania's grandfather, who she'd never met before, was an, even, an evil man. Um, he was someone who had abused his daughter physically and his other children and also his wife. So that was a reason why she did not um, have a relationship with her father and why they'd been estranged. Her children never met him. Now, when they entered the grandfather's sick room, he had beckoned Estefania to come to his bedside and he called her over and he kept saying you you and her mother kind of said go go to him because she thought oh um thank you miss um she kind of thought one by one he was going to kind of say goodbye to the children and as he grabbed hold of Espana, he said if i cannot have you in this life i will do so in the next and then he passed away the others present in that day all heard this and at least six people said that that's what happened and that's what he said to her. And because he was in ill health, they paid it no mind. They did not know at the time, as spiteful as the old man had been, he would become even more spiteful in death. A psychic who was brought in after the story made headlines claimed it was actually the grandfather who had taken possession of Esfania as a way as to punish his daughter. He took away her oldest daughter according to the medium on the day the girls had attempted to contact the boy who had been killed in the road accident they had given estefania's grandfather access to the teenager having been handed that which he coveted he then set about destroying her from the inside out those who knew the spunky team believed she had fought against the invading spirit of her grandfather for as long as she could before giving in after her life ended they think she remained behind to protect her family from his wrath and the screaming and the growling would be her trying to stop her grandfather getting to her siblings. Evening, Sarah. It's alleged that a recording device used inside the home had inadvertently picked up a female voice telling those present, beware of the grandfather. This is widely believed to have been a warning from Estefania to her family. The apartment where these events took place returned to normal after the family moved out. Sorry about the whispering thing, because I've probably just made it all worse for you, haven't I? <laughs> I wrote it in, like, quotation marks to remind myself to whisper it, and I just feel like I've not done you guys anything. <laughs> so sorry. Um, it seems once the original targets were gone from the home, he had no more access to the family and everything kind of stopped. If the grandfather was the one behind... The horrifying series of events that befell Estefania and her family, his decision to leave them in peace is a mystery. 
It's possible he had no choice in the matter and his spirit was trapped in that house but could only have access through Estefania. And once she realised her family didn't need protecting, she had gone to the other side. Hence, he had had no kind of place to, to kind of funnel the energy. Don't know too much how it works. It could be that finding the strength in death that she lacked in life, Esfania ultimately prevailed against an unspeakable evil that she herself, by accident, had unleashed. Um, and I am ex extra sorry for the whispering. Um, but in a more positive thing, I have a light one um, in order to get you off to sleep, which is obviously the crossbow cannibal. Um, so... It, she saw her grandfather about six months before she did the Ouija and um, Ouija board. Um, ha 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 ha. Why not, Nanny? Um, what is it? I'm breaking my rules tonight. Dog's on the bed. You're like, you are staying on the bed. He's like, I'm not used to it. I'm picking my son up to it. I'm, I'm sorry, Hayley. Um, let's go for, um, let's go for a quick poll. Let's do grandfather or Ouija board. Which one was possessing her? Smiley face grandfather. <laughs> Nanny sleeping with the lights on and her dressing gown open. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, we have bunts in this room, like literally. Um, <laughs> And I'm wearing my slippers tonight, all night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got to go fucking outside in a minute and raid my neighbour's wheelie bin. Literally. If, 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 if a Spaniard is in my fucking neighbour's wheelie bin, you, I will have a heart attack on the fucking spot. Um, on the spot. I swear to God, if anyone says... <laughs> Beware the grandfather. <laughs> Literally, you'll be like, fuck my life. Take my bin and leave me alone. Um, it's actually a real story. You can you can, you can, can Google her name. Um, do not hang your leg up the blanket. Um, I literally... I'm just going to throw my rubbish. I used to play basketball at school, actually, so I might actually get... I'm going to throw my window uh, rubbish out my top window and hopefully just get it straight into someone's bin. Um... So funny, I imagine if someone's heard me, one of them just ready to get me when I go upstairs. Veronica, I don't, I don't like scary things. I don't mind it when I tell it, just when I hear it, I don't like it. <laughs> as long as you're okay. Um, <laughs> who was the person, right? Hey, hiya. Who was the person who came into the room and said, can we do the scary one, the, the a paranormal one? Because one of you said it and it's your fault, not mine. Um, you don't like it, why whisper? Um, I don't mind doing the whisper. Nat, see? We've all got Natalie to thank. Uh, I take it your name's Nat, sorry. I just assume. It could be Natalia. Um, so Nat was that one. Going to bed, good luck. Um, I've got more cases, but I don't have more scary ones. Obviously, no true crime is great. Um, what about if we talk about... I've, I've got one It's an American case, but it's a case of a psychic that actually did help solve a murder. And even the police say, like, we, we couldn't have done it if we did not... Um, if we didn't have the psychic helping us so i think that's a good one because it kind of tells the good side of how like spirits and stuff can be used because i actually find a real comfort in like spirituality like i do since my dad died it's, it's offered me a lot i've had really good psychic readers like sally cudmore and here who's on loose women and that reached out to me and gave me a reading about my dad um and i'll probably i'll do like, i'll do no whispering um i promise i'll leave the whispering um Right on my street. Yeah. So Kelly's in here. See, Tarot Medium Kelly. She does she does mediumship and stuff like that. And she's really nice. She's got really friendly red hair as well. So it's not all scary. And she never whispers. Um, I've been told I need to open my third eye. Not in here, you won't. <laughs> you want to get yourself on the hub. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was told to open my third eye by who? Uh, <laughs> who told you that? And are they on the register? Um, <laughs> is that what that is, or is it something else? <laughs> I love Tyra. <laughs> what is the third eye? 
Do you all mean the same thing I mean or not? Oh no. Is this a family show? <laughs> is that not what it is? No. What is the photo then? <laughs> I thought you mean like the thing. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll take the picture down. What? Why is my hair like that? Why is what? Why is angry red hair then like that? What's angry red hair? <laughs> oh, because I said she's got really lovely red hair. <laughs> it's your spiritual... Oh, is it because your mum's ever asked me to do that? Because I would have whacked my bits out straight away. Even in a psychic read reading, I would have said, well, if that's what she needs. Um, <laughs> I would have been swinging sausage. I literally... Um, it's your sixth chakra. I... <laughs> this is why... This is why these people need to help me. It's like that time I went to see that woman and she was trying to read ribbons for me. Um, and I didn't say anything about it. And everyone else said it's not even a thing. And I literally was just picking all these different coloured ribbons. And she was telling me about people I'd met in my past life. Um, what's that all behind you? Don't even start with me. Um, I, did, <laughs> I, just, yeah, I just... I just thought it was like the, um, the, the bit where um, a man's stuff comes out of his thing. That's what I thought the third eye was. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'll never get over it. It was only when I came on here that people made me realise how random that day was. I paid her for that ribbon reading. I said I was going to try and go back to her, didn't I? And I could try and film it on my... Um... I'm going to try and film it. I went for a psychic reading. I paid this woman for £40 and she said, I'm going to read your ribbons. And then when she bought out like an abacus and on the abacus, it was a really big abacus, by the way, there was like probably 90 different types of ribbon and they had like all different patterns colors and she was like you need to pick three of these ribbons and I'm going to tell you about your life and I was like looking I picked like a Christmas ribbon and she was like oh good choice and I was thinking I don't know what's going to be a bad choice here so like literally I went on to pick a spotty pink ribbon and then she started going <laughs> I was thinking, I'm just going to go for a plain one this time because this is not working out. Um, and then she said, when I put them all together, it will paint a picture. And I thought, good ask Tori for that. She's got Crayola. Um, it's your aura colours. Well, mine are fucking Christmas with snowmen on. Fucking brown with pink spots on, my aura is. Which might be the Manjaro coming up my pink butthole. But also, I think I picked like a golden ribbon. And then she started telling me one of my friends had a, a car accident um, from those ribbons. So I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that. I told her that I did have a friend in a car accident. I didn't. I didn't want to disappoint her. <laughs> I was like, yes, yes. And she went, um, was it in the last six months? And I said, I think so. <laughs> I come home with a new friend. I was really sad about. <laughs> She put a sick note and said, one of my friends died in a car accident six months ago. I've just found out. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> they said, how did you find out? the ribbon set. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. <sighs> Just give me a minute. Why do people keep bringing up the fucking ribbons? <laughs> she said he just wants to let you know he's okay. I thought, well, he's not, is he? <laughs> he's had a fucking car accident. This is, this is this is why I have mental health issues because these things happen to me all the time do you know what I mean I need some kind of therapy after that and I'm thinking about going back to it because I really want to film it because I don't think people believe me that it happened um, and it really did happen oh, it's time for therapy for you guys maybe this is my life um, oh. so we had 2.6 at some point because we were doing um, <laughs> Who's a contact and say, I really want to come back. You want my therapy? <laughs> oh, literally, I'll take it on for all of you. Um, this is why I'm quite happy on my own. Do you, I enjoy I enjoy these things, man. <laughs> I was going to become a professional ribbon reader after that. 
typewriter ribbon probably um yeah let me just um i'm gonna open my calendar open. i'm just gonna take a second before i get the giggles halfway for a crying case it just would not be my best um, <laughs> um people always think i make these things up like i honestly went for ribbon we actually found her online last time because i was gonna book one in do you know what i mean um oh i already have to i need to get out of the giggle got something serious um and i wasn't laughing at car accidents by the way before people start spreading that narrative um i don't think it was a real car accident because i didn't have a friend in one um i've got to change my profile picture to my christmas picture as well i don't want to stay on here in case she um in case she's in the room my nickname in my hometown is random Haley because these things happen to me all the time at parties people used to be like oh here's random Haley." Fairlight's energy centre for the middle of the forehead that represents... Oh! oh! Jesus, thank God for you told me that now. Um, <laughs> thanks, Cass. Um, thank God you've told me that now before I actually... Um, someone said we need to open up your third eye. <laughs> and I was all akimbo very quickly. Um, I did, can I just do a poll? Did anyone else think that's what your third eye was, what I thought it was? Or is it just me, honestly? Because as soon as someone said someone tells me to open my third eye, my head instantly went to there. So but it's my, I don't know which way we're going. So you all knew what it was. At least there's 10 people that would have been, 11, that would have been arrested with me. Um, I just assumed it was only boys that had one. Um, oh, I always think I'm quite spiritual, but that's fucking ridiculous. Oh, not a lot of people then. Just me then. Um... I would have just let you know if someone said to me oh yeah that's what I thought it was Fran that's exactly what I thought it was what well, exactly what Fran just said that's exactly what I thought they were asking you to see um and Eleanor yeah I literally would have just been like Nanny Kay please say you were with me <laughs> me, and, me and Nanny Kay need to go out on the town together it's called a third leg no I mean the hole at the end of it not like the actual thing um Has anyone, I'll just quickly ask before I do that. Okay. Has anyone ever bought this game? Good morning. I was thinking about getting it for Christmas, um, but I am a little bit perplexed because it says it's on a TikTok shop and it's called Swing Your Sausage, right? The game. But it actually says. So the Swing Your Sausage game has arrived. It's right. It's got 12 mini games. It's brilliant to do with your friends or with your family on the weekend for any occasion. There's 12 different Christmas. games in the box, all with that the sausage. Down here. Just get it. So the Swing Your Sausage game has arrived. It's got 12 mini it's games. It's 24.99, but it's got 12 games in it. But how many different variations can you have of that? Because you can obviously see you can build a sausage there. Like, how can you play 12 different games? I'm going to see what kind of people have bought it as well, and I'm going to shake. So you can play a hilarious party game, team based challenges, 12 unique mini games. Including salami salon, <laughs> squat worst, <laughs> ketchup and over, meat in the middle, and many more. Easy to learn, fun to master. Comes with two sausages, two sausage swingers, <laughs> one inflatable ball, 12 hot dog buns, and 12 hot dog point tokens. Do you think it's a game I can play by myself? <laughs> it doesn't say what age it's for. I'm taking it, it's not for the kids. Um, <laughs> there's only one person who's dared to leave a review, and he's, but this game was really fun to do with friends. It was, was well designed and good game ideas. Um, <laughs> I have a little sausage pop it. We had that, the big sausage thing you pull apart and it makes a noise. Toy got it from the um, summer fair. <laughs> Um, but how can you play 12 different games when you just stood there? <laughs> oh, you're rushing to buy it. I'm going to look if sales are up tomorrow morning. I'm going to know it's you, buggers. Um, so, another case. Just use pepperoni and a, a shoe It would save you loads of money, wouldn't it? Asking yours if you still might. That, I might just. Yeah, surely it's, um, it's all in the hips. 12, 12, 24 99 though. 
for a bit of like a bit of nickel elastic and a, and a bloody plastic sausage it's not um right we're going to talk about another case because i think i've lost half my community so many people just unfollowed me in that instant um where i've talked about pure madness um Surely no one could be playing Swing the Sausage Xmas Day. My family are going to be. They don't know it yet, but they are going to be. So we're going to talk about this case. And this is Jennifer Lee Bartlett McCready. And we're going to talk about her murder. And so on September the 19th, 1996, in Ohio State, Ohio State Highway Patrol Officer Jack McCready called 911 to report his 30 year old wife missing. He displayed no real sense of urgency at the time and he was kind of going about business. And people did say that at the, the kind of call center where they picked up 911 calls, they kind of said, well, he was a police officer. He was used to dealing with things. He would have known um, the kind of way that you had to deal with these things. So they didn't think much of it. And he kind of phoned in and said, it's me, it's Jack. My wife's missing. Can you send some officers out? Now, three hours later, because he'd made it sound really non-urgent, just like, well, you know, she hasn't come home. I'm a little bit worried. Don't rush. Do your other jobs first. Three hours later, he calls back and he says, can I just cancel the request for assistance? He says, I've looked around my home and my wife has taken most of her belongings. Like she's left me. She's taken £3,000 in cash. And the only thing she's left behind on the side were her wedding rings. So he says, hey, Noreen. He said, look, this isn't really a, a missing person anymore. She's definitely left me. Um, and he says, you know, don't worry. Like, I'll, I'm sure in a couple of days she'll come back home and just don't send anyone out. Now, he failed to mention at the time that she had left behind the sons that she had loved more than life. Uh, like itself she was a natural mother absolutely adored her children and he didn't mention any of those like any of the children where they were none of this two days passed with no word from jennifer and acting under the assumption that she wasn't coming back mccrady had attempted to file a missing person report with washington county sheriff's office in marionetta in ohio so this time he's gone outside of where he works and he's kind of filed a police report and said look um hey sandy how are you doing i'm seen afraid you okay so this police department say to him, you're going to have to go to your local police department to file a report. Like, you can't do that here. Like, you should know better. It's not in our jurisdiction. So with five years of service, I'm glad you're good, Sandy. With five years of service under his belt, McCrady was acquainted with nearly every other officer in the area's tight-knit law enforcement circles. Upon learning that Jennifer, who was known and well-liked by her husband's colleagues, was missing, everyone vowed to do whatever they could do to bring her home. Though McCrady had made a good point of saying she had probably run off with another man, the scenario seemed unlikely given Jennifer's character and how much she adored her family. And he's not really in a catch-22 here because, because he is a police officer and highway patrol, they kind of really look out for each other. So when you say a police officer or a highway patrol man's wife's missing, they're all going to do everything they can. You're going to have much better help than a normal person would miss in. So he knows once he reports that this is going to happen. Hey, Jesus. When questioned as to the state of the couple's marriage, McCrady paints pictures of marital bliss. He says, look, we have petty arguments, but we're madly in love. We have children. You know, I just assume she'll come back eventually. Like we'd never had an argument. I had no reason to believe she was going to leave. And he said, we were absolutely united in our quest to give our sons, who were one and four at the time that she disappeared, the happiest of homes. And we've always discussed that, you know, divorce isn't an option. We'll work through it together. Um, Jesus popped in to give us some love and light after the last case that we did. I'll just show you a picture of her husband. He looks like a bit of a, um, a fatter John Travolta, um, in a nice way. So he, um, despite his claims that the marriage was solid, detectives couldn't shake the feeling that McCrady was hiding something. Even so, with no proof of any wrongdoing on his part and nothing to indicate that Jennifer had fallen victim to foul play, the investigation kind of stalled. There was nowhere really to go with it. Like, we have no body, she could just be missing. And we have to accept in these cases sometimes that um, we have to accept that adults have 
every right to go missing if they want to whether your parents or not you cannot it's not a crime to go missing if you don't want to be found now seeing that they were at a standstill the dispatcher who had taken mccrady's call suggested to the lead detective that he contact a psychic named georgia rudolph um no relation to the reindeer who had been instrumental in helping officers in marietta solve a case in the early 90s as one would imagine, the seasoned lawman scoffed at the notion and said, we're not contacting psychics, like, it's like hoodoo voodoo, we're not doing it. And she goes, what, what else have you got? Like, what else have you got to lose? Um, and he goes, call her then, see what she says. Like, and he's just kind of like, basically saying like, I give in because we've got nothing else, but I'm not expecting anything from it. Um, don't <laughs> After tracking Rudolph down, after tracking Georgia down in a home base of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the dispatcher told her that they had a missing person and wondered if she could offer any insights into what had happened. Now, without a moment's hesitation, the psychic responds that they're not looking for a missing woman. They're looking for a murdered woman. They, she says she's dead. I looked, As soon as I said, tracking down Rudolph, I wouldn't say it, and all the other reindeers used to laugh and call her names the dispatcher shared this information with the lead detective who was more than a little bit skeptical they're like oh okay well there's two chances there she can either be missing or murdered and you're telling me she's murdered um so that's not giving me much now still with no suspects no leads no concrete evidence the crime had been committed that a crime had committed on september the 24th against his better judgment he decides to phone georgia himself and ask her kind of what's going on Although they exchange pleasantries, the detective has been careful to hold his cards close to his chest and give her absolutely nothing. Thank you for the rose. Once formalities were out of the way, he asks Jennifer, Georgia what happened to Jennifer. And she says, well, I can tell you exactly what's happened to her. Thank you, Hayley. She says, thank you, Jasper. Thank you, Lisa. She says the young mother has been shot once execution style in the head. And when he asks who pulls the trigger, she says she didn't know his name, but he was an imposing figure with the physique of a lumberjack. His, her next words sent chills down his spine when she said, and by the way, he's most likely in the police force. His doubts about Rudolph's abilities diminished by the minute. The detective had asked if she knew where she could find Jennifer. And she replies that her body is buried in the south of Belpre at the top of a gravel mark, um, gravel road marked with the numbers 298. Realising they had a lot of information to process, the detective thanks Georgia before ending the call. And he's like, I can't do much with this information because she's given me a description and he compares it to the victim's husband. And he's like, hang on a minute. He is kind of like a lumberjack guy. He's six foot two. He weighs over 200 pounds. I thought they were describing me. <laughs> and he had the build of a logger. Um, piss off all of you. Obsessed with his appearance, he's known to take steroids and bulk up. So he's like, you know, he does look like a lumberjack. No. <laughs> uh, but he thinks to himself, like, there is something very solid there that I can check and prove that's wrong. But like, I can prove there's no gravel road with that number marking on in the south of the county where there's going to be a body. So he goes looking for it. Now, on the same day, coincidentally, a witness has come forward to say that she has seen a highway patrol car coming down an old oil field access road in Torch, Ohio. And that is 11 miles away from where this woman, the psychic, has said that there will be a body. When she locked eyes with the officer behind the wheel, he had stared daggers right through her and she'd been so shaken by the encounter that she thought the trooper could be a danger to others. Since he was out of his jurisdiction, he stops right there, places a call to the more local authorities and brings them in. And the officer arrives on the scene, bent down, raked away the top layer of soil and he finds a blue sleeping bag. So then he brings in the forensic team and the crime scene technicians. After the area was secured, investigators got to work unearthing whatever was buried beneath the soil. Just as detectives feared, inside the sleeping bag was the body of Jennifer McCrady. And this is Jennifer. 
barefoot and dressed in pyjamas with a gunshot wound behind her right ear. It was clear that she had been the victim of homicide and died in exactly the way that Georgia Rudolph had said. On October 2nd, Jennifer's loved ones were notified of the Gridley find and her parents, who never believed for the minute that she had left of her own accord, were understandably devastated. As for her husband, investigators noted that he had bowed his head and wept uncontrollably, but as he, as, no matter how hard he tried, he didn't produce a single tear. Convinced he had killed his wife and buried her in a shallow grave in the middle of nowhere, detectives urged Jack McCready to come clean, and rather than complying, he immediately lawyered up and effectively ended all of the invest, uh, interrogations before they could even begin. A search of the family home uncovered a plethora of evidence pointing to McCready as their killer. Hidden away in the garden, investigators found Jennifer's purse, ID and keys that had been buried on the property. A .357 Magnum revolver, the same model of firearm used in the murder, was also entered into evidence. Unfortunately, a ballistics expert was an un to speak, was an un unable to match the bullets to the weapon. Thank you, CG making it impossible um so what happened is someone had drilled out the barrel of the gun i don't understand the kind of inside outs of guns too much but they had done it in a way that every bullet would be different and there would be none of the usual markings on there that you would be able to match with the gun so in an in addition to this evidence they had a shovel confiscated from the garden turned out to be covered in the same dirt used to cover up the body of jennifer three days later mccrady was charged with murder in the death of his wife jennifer and to no one's surprise, he entered a plea of not guilty. The trial got underway on October the 20th, 1996. During the proceedings, one of Jennifer's co-workers testified she was planning on divorcing her husband at the time of her death. She had made no secret of the fact the marriage was falling apart and she just wanted to take her sons to have a fresh start. And this was the far cry from the perfect marriage that her husband had described. Prosecutors theorised that on the night of September the 19th, Jennifer had told her husband she was leaving him and taking the boys. An argument ensued which had quickly turned violent and in a fit of temper, McCrady had shot his wife, killing her instantly. He then covered her head with a trash bag to prevent blood from getting on the floor in the carpet before placing her in a sleeping bag. The white kitchen trash bag was still tied around her head when the body was found. As his young son slept in their bed, McCrady had made the short drive to the oil field road in Torch where he had disposed of his wife's body in a shallow grave. Since he was in a rush, he hadn't taken time to dig more than a few inches. Investigators believed he had intended to move the body as soon as possible, but Georgia and the woman McCrady had spooked um, by coming down the same road when she saw him leave had ruined his plans. The jury took 14 hours to reach a verdict, and in the end, McCrady was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 15 years to life. He is currently still housed at the Chilcothy Correctional Institution. McCrady has come up for parole on two occasions, so far without success. In 2014, the parole board ruled against his release, citing they believed he was still a risk to the public. In October of 1996, Jennifer's parents were granted custody of their grandsons. The most innocent of victims, the boys lost both their parents on the night of September the 19th. In a horrible act that spiked, can never be, <clears throat> in spite of no matter how many times their grandparents tried to make things right, it will never be put right. Contrary to the McCrady claims, at the time Jennifer had not been engaged in any kind of affair, nor was she a runaway wife. In reality, she was a mother who would have done absolutely anything for her children and wanted to have a really good future and knew with her husband how volatile he could be, they would never have that. Well, it's been speculated that his abuse of steroids played a role in fueling his uncontrollable rage. There is no way of knowing that for sure. Jennifer, he believed, was his property and he wasn't about her to let her live life without him. Since he refuses to speak on the subject and probably wouldn't tell the truth if he did, his motivations will never really be known fully. The prosecutor who procured the guilty verdict against McCrady personally phoned Rudolph to thank, him, thank her for the, in the aftermath, aftermath of the trial. Thanks, Ella. He and the other investigators who put Jennifer's killer where he belonged never hesitated to give her full credit where credit was due. In a sea of charlatans, this one of those rare instances where a genuine medium and clairvoyant used her gift of second sight to help bring a killer to justice. <clears throat> I'm just going to put some pictures on the big screen for a moment. Um, 
So this is Jennifer. Thank you, Christina. This is the road where her body was recovered. Thank you for the candles. This is Jennifer with her youngest son. She's a beautiful woman, isn't she? And you can tell, like, she is friendly and her face is really open and loving and she she adored her children around i think that's probably what made her brave enough to say like i i want to start again and i mean this is back in 1996 we viewed things very differently than in the courtroom if it was today they would just be saying this was a, a sheer case of domestic abuse of a woman who was scared of a volatile husband and break up violence when she tried to leave he finally took her life John Travolta, um, Jack McCready, a psychic Jordan Rudolph, and the last picture of Jennifer. Do you have a family guy? Oh, very loud drinker. Um, It depends on how you feel about it, Jesus. I imagine because you're a member of the church um, that you fully believe um, that psychics are wrong, but I find a lot of peace in the spiritual church. <clears throat> so it's open to interpretation. Some people do believe, some people don't believe, some people find peace in it, some people don't. Um, but I actually do believe in psychics. Let's just, let's do a little poll just to see really. I thank you whoever subbed as well because I think I've missed someone when I was trying not to weep. Um, <clears throat> this is no offence um, either way. So if you believe in psychics, put a smiley face. And if you don't believe in it at all, and that's your own personal choice, put a crying face. I just kind of want to see how people feel about it. I find it hard with cases like that where she had no inside story where she's literally said not only where her body would be, the exact road, um, but exactly how she died as well to say that, that they don't have any kind of power. They make it up. What you just think she guessed exactly where she her body was gonna be. She just kinda of guessed a number and guessed how she died. Um I don't know, I think um I've 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 actually been to a spiritual church and I've seen people get so much kind of um just a weight lifted off their shoulders and I think even if you um even if you don't particularly believe in it it's really beautiful to watch somebody who literally has not seen their loved one for so many years and then they just get told like they're okay like you can move on like they're good I think that's that's something that you can't buy and also I think there are um just like with every other thing in the world there are a lot of people <clears throat> that pretend and those people make it bad for the ones that really do have a gift and really do try to use it for good um yeah i get it esther like i don't um i don't um push it on anyone like i don't need um i don't need people to believe or not believe i started going to spiritualist church after i lost my dad because i was just looking for some kind of connection and when i saw people like a little old man be told like your wife is here um thank you tracy for subscribing um and she wants you to know, like, she's fine. Stop moping around. Stop doing it. And he was just like, just the look on his face of just being like the comfort. Yeah. And just being like, you know, I can just move along with things. And one day I'll be with her again. I just think that's beautiful. Um, and I think if the same, if I think the same if people get it from church, if people get it from church, like no matter what religion or whether you go to the, the chapel, whether you go to the temple, whatever you have to do to have that um, feeling of like there's something else. I think it's beautiful. Like, I, I really think it's beautiful because I think there's nothing worse than believing death's just death and you're not going to see those people again. Like, I needed that with my dad. I needed that to think, like, oh, I've not said everything I need to say, but one day I will, that he's okay, that he can still see me and my children. Because he never met Tori and I wanted to know, like, did he see Tori? Um, did he know in the Daily Mail this week, proving the Can you put it in the Discord, Kelly, so we can all have a look at it? Um, you know, everyone's entitled to their own belief, but I just hope people... 
everyone has some belief and some faith that just helps them. Because I think, no, Esther, I get it. You can believe in whatever you want. And I think sometimes if you've not had good experiences, like you won't believe. Like a lot of people are like really skeptic and they're like, show me then, show me. And people should be able to say that. Like why, what, you know, it's like me saying, oh, you, you, I can't tell you, but there's like a uh, Michael Barry's monster next to me. Like just believe it, just believe he's sat there. You know, people want to see it and I get that. Um, what's Discord? Um, I have a Discord for subscribers of my channel, which is like three pound a month. Um, which is a Discord um, uh, app where it's like a chat app where we're all in there. Um, and there's like several different folders like poetry, crafts, DIY, chat, um, ranting folder, food porn. Uh, no, none of <laughs> Michael Perry was still alive. Top, middle, or bottom. Um, <laughs> he's up my bottom. Nanny, you can't come in the lives anymore. You can't come here anymore. Because <laughs> you're walking me into trouble every every time you go. <laughs> um, can we just take a moment to appreciate that Nanny is doing all of this? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so Discord's just a beautiful place for lovely people who are there for each other. Um, yeah, there was loads of mods in here. Sophie's in here, Kiki's in here, Hattie's in here, Shannon's in here. Um, there's millions of mods in here tonight. Yeah, we are doing small cases. Not, not like I Jojo's here as well. Not like I should be. Um, Lee Barrymore alone. <laughs> um, the Savage Sea got don't, don't even start me today. I literally, um, we love Nanny K, but Nanny K is going to get me cancelled. Witnessed the incident and said, this isn't self-defence. Like, he is attacking a woman. <clears throat> Correctional programs, Sheriff Grady Judge mentioned that Colin was part of the Charlotte County Correction Program, indicating prior involvement with the juvenile justice system. Now, the family's trouble escalated dramatically on February the 14th, 2023, when Colin, then 15 years of age, was involved in the death of his father in Oklahoma. The incident happened around 1 p.m. when Colin himself, at the age of where well, he was 15 at the time, called 911 reporting he had just shot his father. He stated there had been an argument during which his father allegedly pulled a knife on him and chased him through the house. He said when he was cornered in a bedroom, he just happened to find a gun and shoot his father twice, once in the head and once in the chest. Colin was arrested and charged with first degree murder. However, the Lincoln County District Attorney's Office dropped the charges, stating they could not definitively rule out self-defense. The affidavit noted discrepancies between the evidence of the scene and Colin's initial story, but despite that, they still dropped all of the charges. <clears throat> so there was no knife at the scene anywhere near his father to prove that his father had been chasing him with any kind of knife through the house. There was no kind of furniture moved or anything like that to suggest like, like he was running across the room while his father chased him and was trying to find a handgun. It was almost like he'd walked into a room with a handgun out and shot his father once in the chest and once in the head. There was no other kind of signs around that had been signed kind of any kind of self-defense, but still they said, we can't really rule it out. So we're not going to file any charges at all. <clears throat> Thank you for the raise, Amy. So following the dropping of the charges in Oklahoma, Colin was free to locate with his mother, Catherine, and they were free to move across state lines to Port Charlotte in Florida. Reports indicate that after the incident with his father, Colin was Baker acted, which means involuntary committed for a mental health evalu evaluation and claimed he was going to unalive himself if he was released. Probation at some point after moving to Florida, Colin was placed on probation for again assaulting his mother. Now, from what we hear, his mother turned a blind eye to a lot of the things happening. And a lot of the time, hey Twiggy, a lot of the time his mother would say to police, I don't want to press charges. I don't want to get him in trouble. It also seems that when she moved him across state lines after his father's death, she cut him off from other members of the family. She stopped him taking any accountability. And she was kind of like, let's move on with this new life. She spoiled him with a lot of the money from his father's estate. There's pictures of him online. Um, I think I got one of them where he's just posing next to brand new cars with big ribbons on. I mean, this this is within six months of his father being shot dead in in the house. Um, so there's lots of pictures of him like this. Neighbors, um, the new neighbors said, "Look, I saw him 
dragging his mum through the street by his by her hair. He would shout at his mum. He was definitely abusing his mum. And the next day they would see his mum on her own and they'd be like, are you okay? And she'd be like, absolutely fine. Um, don't worry about it. You know, we've got it under control. I don't want it reported. So his mum was constantly kind of, in some ways being a mother, right? In some ways being a mother, in some ways escaping him from taking any accountability. Hey, Lauren. So on September the 8th, of 2024 just gone polk county sheriff's office received a 911 call from colin griffiths himself again he claimed his mother was bleeding from the neck and allegedly she had fell on a knife after a very long fight at his grandmother's home in auburndale in florida witnesses including neighbor nancy jones reported seeing a disturbing altercation jones who was sitting on her front porch observed Colin grab his mother by the hair and forcibly drag her inside the house after she tried to escape. Thank you for the heart guys. She said, I knew he was a troubled kid and we'd seen it time and time again. Sheriff Grady Judd later revealed the incident began with an argument when his mum had asked him to do a chore, which led Colin to run away to his grandmother's house and his mother Catherine to drive there in an attempt to bring him back home to do chores and this is when it's escalated. According to the Polk County Sheriff's Office, Colin used a 12-inch kitchen knife with an 8-inch blade to stab his mother twice in the neck. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Anne-Marie. When deputies arrived, they found Colin surprisingly calm and collected, despite having blood on him. He immediately requested an attorney, raising suspicions among the investigators, who then realised he's done all this before. Sheriff Judd didn't mince words when describing Colin. He says he's violent, he's dangerous, he's capable of showing no remorse at all. Everyone that should be special to him in his life is dead because they crossed him. Between these two incidents, Colin was arrested for beating his mother in Port Charlotte, an event witnessed by his grandmother. He was on probation for this assault at the time of his mother's death and had violated the terms by being at his grandmother's house. A neighbour in Port Charlotte, like we said, said that he had a mild temper until it came to his mother and he held some kind of control over her and almost acted like a violent husband towards her. And you have to start asking questions about why his father died. Did his father die? Thank you for the me TikTok. Did his father die so he could continue to abuse his mum in peace? Was it one day when he was being disrespectful to his mother that his father kind of said that's not going to happen? Or was this just a brat who was used to getting everything he could possibly ever want and anytime someone said no, it was going to turn to violence? Because in order to be able to take your parents, the people that brought you into the world, he's going to be dangerous to anyone who comes across him, a girlfriend, a wife, someone sharing a dorm at university, anyone who, yeah, Twiggy, he did. Anyone who tells him no is, is going to meet this same level of violence. At the moment, it's only his parents he's around who are asking him to do things. But at some stage, you're going to have teachers, like people at work, a wife, a family, children. So this, 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 he's 17, has two parents dead, both at his hands at this point. After the incident involving his father, reports indicate that he was Baker acted and claimed he was going to unalive himself. This raised significant questions about mental state and the support he received following these traumatic events. Sheriff Judd again says, I don't think it's his mental state. When I look at him, I see a psychopath. I see erratic behaviour and I see someone who cannot be fixed. Thank you, Brian. Colin Griffin is currently being held in Polk County Jail on first degree murder charge for his mother's death. The Polk County Sheriff's Office has requested that the state's attorney prosecute him as an adult, given the severity of his crimes and his history. Furthermore, Sheriff Judd has asked Oklahoma authorities to reopen the investigation into Charles, his father. My question is, was there anything else could have been done, he said, because had Oklahoma been able to act, Catherine would still be alive and well today. The tragedy has deeply affected multiple communities. Catherine Griffiths was a beloved Florida virtual school teacher. The organisation released a statement saying we are very saddened to learn about the loss of a beloved teacher. We offer our sincerest condolences and our hearts go to our family, friends and community. Now, this case serves as a stark reminder of the complex issues about juvenile crime, mental health, the justice system, domestic violence, parent-child relationships, 
As legal proceedings unfold, many questions remain unanswered, leaving communities in both Florida and Oklahoma to grapple with the devastating loss of two parents and the uncertain future of a troubled teen. Now, this is an ongoing case, and obviously that's all I can tell you up to now. There has been no sentencing, been no trial. There's unlikely to be this this year or into next year, but we will keep an eye on this case. But I just think, how is he able to pick up a handgun Shoot his father in the chest and the head. Thank you guys for the gifts. Not face any... What are you doing? Me? Yeah. I want to ask you a question. What is it? Um, can I take Taylor to play with crime on Sunday? You... <laughs> what are you wearing? Mm. Why have you got toys pyjamas on? <laughs> Never mind, I think I'm about going away. <laughs> when do they fit you when you were seven? Hey, like... <laughs> Who are you taking to the aquarium with? Me and Kate, It depends if she wants to go. I just asked her, she said, yeah. Okay. What? <laughs> Why are you laughing? What? Why are you wearing my slippers with socks as well? Um, hey, just Jules. <laughs> what? Are you there? You look like someone's putting you in the tumble dry. In the hot wash. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So I think it's tight fitting. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like true. You're telling me. Um, <laughs> She looks like someone's drunk. Ten XL. It's not. Um, yeah, it's it's a really really sad story, but I think it, it does. Um, she was she was catty. I'd get I'd get um cancelled straight away if um you saw how tight fit in her pajamas were. It looks like she's. Oh, you're still good. Not <laughs> looks like they're you toys. <laughs> she can't bend down to get a drink. <laughs> I can't get this on. I didn't realise the weapon was on there. Um, so I'm just going to take that off. Before I get in trouble. I mean, he, even when he's like 17, he's a full grown man, isn't he? Look how tall he is. Like he's much bigger than his mum. Look at the difference in the sizes. Do you know what I mean? When he's pulling her around by her hair or dragging it in and out of houses or... She has no chance here. Oh, I sneeze. A hundred percent, Laura. You have to think having an adult son at home who is doing that is just the same as living with a, a violent male and abuser, a partner. Um, if anything, it's far worse because it's someone that you've brought into the world. And you only have a responsibility to a child yeah. until they're 18. And after that, if they cannot respect you and they cannot treat you properly, they need to go. Um, because you have every right to live a normal and productive life. And as hard as it is, sometimes you have to love someone from afar. Because there is no place in society where an adult child should be laying their... Like an actual adult should be laying their hands on you or verbally emotionally abusing you in any way and you don't have to put up with it and i'm sorry for anyone in this room that's going through it and daughters and i think often we think well i brought them into the world they're my problem but they're not you you're they're not your problem now they're adults he smashed the house listening i would phone the police and i would have him arrested and i always think it is your job as a parent to phone 999 and hold him accountable before it's a girlfriend he's killing or somebody else he's smashing up the house sometimes it's an act of love um to do that and i think it comes with responsibility i said yesterday your main job as a parent is to prepare your children for the next stage of life adulthood and right now by allowing that in your house that's not happening so i would 100 percent hold him accountable phone the police get a restraining order and say Never come back to my house until you can hold yourself in a proper way because I'm not living in fear of you. That's it. I haven't seen my oldest six years due to the violence. He learned from his dad, unfortunately. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking that, we, that people have to make that decision. But you have to be called to be kind sometimes and you have to teach your children and adult children life lessons. And the life lesson is if you're living in my house and you're disrespecting me, scaring me, frightening me, then you're not welcome here because I deserve peace. I've raised you, I've taken you through your childhood, I've provided for you, I've done all the, the parents, I've done everything I can for you, and I'm not your punching bag and you need to leave. Um, I would support any parent through doing just that.
when it's a disabled child it's slightly it's slightly different um it's it's about intent and accountability and if it depends on the disability it it depends on on what they're aware of what they can control all of those things so no parent should still have to live in fear and nobody should be asked just by autism and any of those things to be living with someone who is bigger and stronger than you that is hurting you no one should have to live through that no matter what help you have to get the places you may have to go to for help some time away to live a life like nobody signs up to have to accept it and i and i and i'm talking about adult children here once a child gets to 18 if there's a certain place where you're like i can't cope none of us are having a good quality of life i'm getting hurt i don't have any support you don't have to go through that like it, it's you know it's really hard 23 Laura, i'm sure he's much taller than you stronger than you bigger than you um and you, I, I literally would not, I would not question phoning the police. I have a 17 year old and if she ever raised her hand to me, I would phone the police instantly because it's my job as a mum to show her a different way and I would, I would not have it. Um, I would, I would suggest any parent do the same thing. She needs to learn, which she's never done that to be fair. Um, but they have to learn like in life, you can't attack people. If you do, there's, there's a price you pay because I don't want her to go out into the real world and start committing domestic abuse against her husband or children. Um, so I wanted to learn like violence is not acceptable. I wouldn't even, um, I wouldn't even have it if she was getting in my face and she was like trying to intimidate me. I would not have it because I've got younger children in the house as well. Thank you, Hattie. Like, I have younger children in the house who will be learning from her. So I don't want to put myself in that situation where, you know, definitely it's really scary it's really scary would it not go on the criminal record oh well if he's if you have a 23 year old adult son living in your home who has learned that by shouting screaming or smashing stuff up he's intimidating you as his mother and you're walking on eggshells like in a normal domestic abuse relationship it's it's the price of the choice isn't it like you've raised your ch your child they know that violence is wrong and you, as a mum, don't deserve to, leave. if anything, you should be treated like a queen. You've raised your child. You've gone without stuff for your child. You've made your life about him for 18 years. Now he's 23. And sometimes the only way to get them out of your house is to phone the police and say, this is what happened and I don't want him back here. I'm done. It is exactly, Becky. It's, it's the consequence. It's a consequence. And as parents, that's our main responsibility is to teach consequences. You know, we teach it from very young, right? So I say to Toy, tidy up the front room or I'm not putting the TV on. You've made the mess. You tidy away your toys. I'm not putting away the TV. She learns very quickly. It's very much easier for me to tidy up the front room so I can get what I want or you don't get what you want. That's it. We do the same with dishes. Taylor, do the dishes or I'll take your phone away from you. I've asked you three times, do the dishes or I'll take it away. So we're constantly teaching our children consequences. Do well at school. I'll get your magazine on the weekend. All of it. You're always bartering. So when they get to 23, there, there is a point where you're like, I'm not finding that comfortable. I'm scared. I'm scared in my own house. And the consequences are you can stop because the next time you do that, I'm phoning the police and I don't want to see you again. Thank you, Soph. There are numbers up here, helplines, for anyone who needs help. I think... Um, I always say, oh, that's the crime cases one. <laughs> um, thanks, though. I always say the the strongest thing that I've seen parents do is hand their children to the police. And it's often the best thing they've done. It's not easy. And everyone's like, I would never grass, or they're my kid, or I'd never give my kid a criminal record. What about their college? What about their job choices? What if you're not alive? What if you allow it and you allow it and you allow it because you're trying to save their criminal record and you're trying to save them from not paying the punishment? You get a call in 10 years' time because he's just smashed his wife to death. You know at that point. If I had phoned the police and got him some help and he had made some restitution to what he had done, that wouldn't have happened. Hey, Aunt Sally, I know that sounds harsh and I know that sounds extreme, but that's our job as a parent is to foresee this is not going well. And if he can victimise me, he can victimise any woman or anyone weaker than him. And it's your job. And it may save his whole life. It may be the one thing being locked in the police station crying and thinking, I can't even phone my mum. 
my mum the one who's always there for me because she's the one I've scared it's her house I've smashed up maybe that's what he needs hey Aunt Ellie because no adult at 23 should be holding his mum in a place of domestic abuse and that's what it is if he's scaring you if he's smashing things up if he's smashing things up with his fist he is victimizing you the same as any other man so i would always say phone the police if he does it phone the police hold him to account and make him better for the future because otherwise you'll have to you'll have to live with the consequence of knowing um you missed an opportunity i phone the police i would phone, if, if one of my if my 17 year old daughter come down and now start smash up my house i'd phone the police in an instant in an instant, I would do it for her and for me and for the younger children in the house. It's my job as a mum. That's it. I Look what happened in this case we've just covered. She made excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. He, he killed his dad, so she bought him new cars, moved him to a new area so no one knew what he'd done, kept on letting him do whatever he wanted. Now she's not here either. But if, you know, even after they said they weren't going to file charges, if she had said to him... You know, you need to get mental health help. You need to deal with this. You need to deal with that. Like, we're not doing this anymore. No new cars. No, you can have whatever you want. Or said to the police, I'm not taking him home. He's just killed his dad. I I can't cope. Or the, when he beat her up and she told him, like, I don't want to file any charges. Like, if she, if, you know, there could have been saving moments in this case. Um. Okay, Olivia, I hope your head feels better soon. God rest her soul. Yeah, because this should never happen. Um. I always think like when it's our children, we feel this like real responsibility of like, oh, but I don't want him to get in trouble. Like I don't want I don't want that to happen to her. Like I don't want to do that. But it's it's our job to hold them to account. Hundred percent it is. Um, thank you for the heart, me's guys. Hey Lee. Um, hello. I'm going to have a quick vape. Um. He had a life to his dad, Sydney, which they believed it was just self-defence, even though there was evidence to say contrary. They let him off it, and a year later, he's killed his mum. It happened in September of 2024, just in America. Midnight heart, me. Thank you for the heart, me, guys. Oh. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely terrible. Maybe at his peak. He doesn't know what he's doing. Did, is, can I just ask? Thank you, Frankie. Thank you for the comment, clouds, guys. Can I just ask? Is he? Um, does he have like additional needs, Carla, or is he? Is he just? You mean just like when he gets so full of anger, he doesn't know what he's doing? Because I'm in no way a professional on this. Like I, when I talk on instances like this, I talk as a mother, not as somebody who studied criminology or anything like that. Like I haven't had perfect past experience with this. Um, yeah. Things like cry are quite good when it when it when they're like children to learn discipline. It won't it wouldn't be so good. When he calms down, he's so shocked what he's done. I think I missed the first thing you said when I um asked you because thank you, thank you to all the gifts guys and helping me do my gift goal. Um, my daughter's the same ADHD and recently. I think um without without sounding really harsh, right? Sometimes. We have rose tinted glasses, right? Because they're our children, right? And every time we look at our kid and they're doing something really not wrong or naughty, like we also gave birth to them, we fed them as babies, we nurtured them, we saw them in their two tight pajamas, and we laughed and giggled with them. So we find it very hard to judge them fairly about behaviour sometimes, because um, they're ours, right? So we do. So sometimes things we, would, we wouldn't we would accept from a man or we would recognise straight away as domestic abuse, like I'm trying to say it kindly, like in our own children, we would find it very hard to see that. So we would make excuses like, but what, when he's done it, like he feels really bad, like he, he can't really control it um, or other things like that, that perhaps if it was a man doing it and blinded yep, and we were scared, we'd think, well, still, I'm in a position of being really scared here. Um, thank you, Tracy. So I think sometimes it's um it's helpful to talk to other people and actually explain it and be like like not I'm not saying here but like people you know in real life and be like really open, um 
and be like this is what's happened these are the names i get called like this is some of the messages he sent me um well it, i get it laura i would i would feel awful i would feel worse if it was my son because as a mother it's a real a, a real bind right because it's almost like well he's my responsibility who else is he if he's not mine but at the same time you have a responsibility to yourself like you've raised your children they're adults now and you have a responsibility to be safe and at peace in your own home same as every person in the world deserves to have peace in their own home um it's it's domestic abuse amongst parent, parents and children is on the rise dr drastically drastically because we're living in a society where children are frustrated by computer games by they have a sense of entitlement children these days i'm going to be a youtube star i'm going to have this money my mum's going to get this for me my dad's going to get this for me that you know there's a generation of people who are entitled to things we as parents myself included i own this i buy my children things because they've been for emotional struggles and sometimes I'll over buy for them because their dad doesn't get them anything. So we're always, especially mums, because I speak from part of a mum, we parent from guilt. We parent from guilt. We give them what we didn't have. We want to make things easy for them. We want to make things seamless for them. But sometimes we are making things worse for ourselves and for society in the future. Um, I have a 17 year old, she has a full time job, she pays rent and she still does household things because she is going to have to cope on her own outside of my house. Um, and I say to her, you know, you work full time, you earn a full time wage, it doesn't matter what I earn. Um, you chose not to be at college, so you've chose to have an adult job. Um, it's, it's Sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes when she says, well, actually, I don't want to, and I'm like, you know, I could probably cope without the rent. Um, but at the same time, it's about responsibility. It's just, it's hard sometimes um you, we do don't we as single mums especially as single mums we're like we want to give you we didn't you haven't got the whole family like so we want to kind of like make up for this make up for that try and do this we try and do everything all the time and like you know there's times when i'll ask my kids to do something and they won't do it and i'll go i'll just go and do it myself um when i was young it was really structured like if you want this you're going to do this this and this and every night you're going to do this job um so we, we were kind of we, we overcompensate but i just wonder sometimes if we're ruining our children emotionally for the future because they're moving out of home they can't cope um i was paying rent. Say, say me i always paid rent from the age of 15 because i was working and i was earning enough money to pay rent so it's just um 100 percent carly it has to be like um it has you know parenting is the hardest job in the world it's the hardest job in the world because i naturally want them to have absolutely everything i want them to have everything i didn't have i want them to have the best of everything i've worked really hard to be in a position where i can give them more than i ever have been able to before i've been broke up until two years ago literally had nothing borrowed money for nappies borrowed money for milk um went days when i wouldn't have dinner just so i could feed them like it was it was horrible my brother would buy the kids trainers because they didn't have embarrassing trainers like i was on my ass all the time um, it was only when I joined TikTok I've got to a place now where I could move out of a refuge and furnish a whole house by myself because I worked all the hours. I would put 10, 12 hours a day into content and go live, research 10 cases, get videos up. And I felt like I was always doing it. Wake, I wake till two, three o'clock in the morning, then wake up at seven for school runs. And I'm glad I've done that. But at the same time, I don't want it to become like, oh, you can have everything you possibly want and just dis disrespect the shit out of me. Um... I mean, it's hard sometimes. It's hard to be like, no, <laughs> that's not happening. It's, it's, you know, parenting's the hardest job in the world, like, honestly, like it is. We love them so much, like, we would do anything for them. But sometimes saying no is what they emotionally do need um, and to grow. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> you know, sometimes the hardest thing in the world is the best thing. Um, I never took a penny of my kids. I am... Um, so, Pammy, like, things like we, we've got planned in the future, like holidays or trips or whatever, all of Tegan's money will go towards her place. And actually, 17, it costs, she costs double what the other kids do. And she has to get to a stage where she really, because she was just, she was, all of her money that she had, that I didn't, she would just, she spends on crap anyway, all the time, because she doesn't know what to do. So, when she was at college, it was different. Like, I paid for your driving lessons. I paid for 
the things you need, your bus pass, everything else. But she made a choice not to do college this year. And I said, well, if you're going to be working, because I hope that she would be like, I'll stay at college, but she didn't want to. Um, so she's working now. Um, oh, my youngest boy went in there. I'm so putting back with sleep. Oh, pink. Oh, I literally can't even imagine that. We thought she'd go ahead. Call police on him Thursday. I'm glad you did call police on Kim if you needed to, because that must have been one of the hardest calls you've ever made, but you loved him enough to do it. And I really do think that is the truth. You have to love your children and what you want them to have in the future more than that mum guilt of like, I can't phone the police on my own child. Yeah, because they 100% probably, she pays hardly anything, like literally, but it is just enough that she has to understand that you have some things you have to pay for, your phone, me, your driving lesson, then you've got whatever left. It's, um, I'm not saying anyone don't live seen now, two boys moved out. Yeah, it's just a, I'm going Dutchland, yeah. I can't believe I said that the other night, Mum. I've never been to Dutchland. Uh -huh. I'm, I've had my son locked up before. I'm, I take my hat off to you, Mum. I, I, I literally, I've seen some cases where a mum has known her child has stabbed someone or something like that, and she has, she has handed him over to police. And the comments we really mixed, people going grass. How could you grass on your own kid? And those like me thinking, you fucking hero. You fucking hero. Because to look your child in the face, know they've taken someone's life, know the heartache and the blame you place upon yourself and still phone 999 because you know they've taken the life of somebody else's kid. You, that takes strength. It takes love. It takes accountability. It takes all of that. It takes remorse. Um, and you're also explaining to your child you've done something, you've hurt someone, you've taken someone's life. I can't help you now. It, I can't, it makes me even like tear up because I think picking up that phone and even saying the words, like it was it was my child. It, awful. But I take my hat off to parents who've done it. I don't see the alternative. You just let them keep going on doing it and just do nothing. Um, it's really hard. Thank you guys for the gift. Thank you, Caroline, very much. No, I lost my child three weeks. My safety it made a difference. It's um, it's really it's it's really hard. Like I get it, it's really hard, and I get some people who literally pick up the call ten times, thinking I can't do it, I can't do it. But you have to um, you have to stay so safe yourself, right? I've got some friends who've got sons because I've only got daughters. Um, my best friend used to have issues with her son when he was fourteen. He was six foot four. And she was like barely five foot. He was massive. And I was saying to her, he's not going to hurt you. He's got the power to kill you. Um, it took ages for her to get help. She kept saying like, he's my son. Like admitting that he's hurt me is admitting I failed. Like I can't control him. And I said, the alternative is that he'll spend the rest of his life in prison for murder. And you'll be dead for your other children. Or you do what you do now and just say, look, I need help. I can't control him and get him some help. So maybe he'll become better. He would literally, the size difference was ridiculous. So there was nothing she could have done. Nothing. Um, I can't get help for my boy. I think, um, I li literally, I, I don't have all the answers, honestly. Like, thank you, Miss Queen. I'm only talking as a mother here. Like, I don't have any previous experience in, in, in this, this particular field of, like, what services there are. Um, I saw that trace actually. There's been a couple of instances. There's one um, that happened, I think it was in Essex. Um, thank you, Miss Queen, for the candles. Um, I don't know what kind of helplines are out there. I don't know who can help. Like me and my mods can have a look in for, for, in for the next life, the kind of places that you would go for help in these situations. Because um, I wasn't going to talk about this tonight, so I didn't really have anything ready. Um, but honestly, like I take my hat off to all the parents out there who are struggling, who have these issues going on. And you're still there and you're still loving your kid and you're still trying. And I think that's what it's about. Even the accountability thing is still loving them, like still loving them for it all. But accepting like, I'm still not going to let you do this. I love you, but I love you enough that you need help. Women's Aid would definitely want. I'm just wondering if there's any like specialist services for people who have like send children who are doing this and also for adult children who are doing this, because there must be more branches that are specialised just for parents. Um 
because there's there has to be because it's becoming such a massive problem now um my ex brother was raised very entitled he's in his 40s still scream as much exactly be like by ignoring these behaviors you're just creating a monster talking to monsters in alicia um no um you're creating a monster like nobody should ever be fearful of their child no one where have you been miss alicia Cam's crisis team for Sen. Will they help with things like this as well? Safeguarding for the parents, definitely. We did a few um, Sarah updates earlier, just like the dad was saying that um, the stepmom was under the spells of black magic. And he used... Um, sleeping? Well, you just wake back up and rolled into my life. I'm very honoured to see you, my little bestie. Um, night, Carol. And I'm... I literally, I'm going to get off in a minute, but I um, I did enjoy tonight. I know the, the crime cases were um, were a lot, but I do think we had a few giggles tonight. It was um, mainly at my madness, but we have um, oh, so what's um, Kiki sent me. So there is a a group called Pegs, which is Parental Education Support Group, a uh, growth support, and it's um. A, child to a parent abuse supporting parents and professionals um and it is is a social enterprise set up to support parents carers and guardians who experience in child parent abuse including those with adult offspring we don't directly work with the child displaying the behaviors but have a network of partners whose expertise lie in this area we also train frontline professionals to recognize and effectively respond to cpa um and they they do have a whole website it's www.pegsupport.co.uk if one of the mods can actually um please pin that write it down and pin it so it's www.pegs oh peg support sorry so just peg and then one s so pegsupport.co.uk if someone could just pin that and we'll also post a link to that in the the self-help folder in the discord um that's good to know that 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 is there because um, they can signpost you to all the most the local places in your area. Um, thank you, Lee. Can I just pin that? I could have if I see it again. So it's just one S. So Lee's got the right one. Um, I didn't explain it very well. So it's exactly that. So thank you, Caroline. Um, school nurse can also do referrals. I think... Um, yeah, I think it's, a, I'd like to think like loads, of, if, you know, even if there's five people in here who have experienced it, like maybe even just reaching out now and maybe 2025 will look very different to you. And I just, I know that giving a parent or a woman peace inside their own home is like absolutely priceless because I've just experienced it myself for the first time is having like finally peace in my home, um, a full girl household and just being like able to be at peace. Um, you, money can't buy that. Honestly, it can't buy it. Thank you for the November hearts. Right, guys, I'm going to leave this here tonight because I went to bed so late last night. I was knackered this morning. Um, tomorrow I will do the crossbow cannibal because I've already got that researched and do a couple of other cases as well. Um, I'll be live in the daytime tomorrow at some stage, whether it's just to have a talk or talk about some topical cases that are happening right now. Um, just to have a chat. I can't do another night like last night. I think I finally got to sleep at 2 a.m. Um, yeah so good night everyone thank you for coming into the live tonight i hope everyone had a little bit of a giggle as, as well as learning about some crime cases um and thank you all for being a part of such an amazing community um nanny k you're in my bad books um i love you nanny k um and no ribbons please it'll be very triggering before bedtime and um, welcome to everyone else who's followed and everyone who's subscribed if you get touched on the mods you can come into the discord and we'll see you in there um and thank you to the new mods as well thanks guys and I'll sort the letters out for tomorrow key. Out for tomorrow key.